Brutal. All right, oh, here we go. rolled out a uh, new UI. Restreamed it? Yeah. Is it nice? I don't know. Uh, hey, guys. Let's see. The overheating audio issue today. No, we won't have that because we're not even using the expensive system that we're doing. All right. Hey, hey, hey. All right. So we got video here. Uh, this is my this is the shore that we have in uh, for the guest shots. I can't con connect this one because it's a condenser. So I'll explain the, 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 the wacky way we're doing the show. I should do it like this. Which mic am I on? Um, we're just waiting for Paul. He needed to reboot. RIP oh. beeping. Hi, Paul. Hey. Hey. Hi, Paul. You sound robotic. That's Suncast. No. <laughs> Not me. Suncast. <laughs> All right, so you are you good if I disconnect? Yeah, Paul's video is very low in quality. Yes, yeah. it is. Uh oh. Hmm. <laughs> Paul, are you having any kind of internet issues where you are? <clears throat> Not that I was aware of. Mm hmm. Seems like something's going on here. Paul sending me 320 by 180. Awesome. At 15 frames a second. But you know what, Paul? Your latency is pretty good. <laughs> I just shut up. Okay. What is uh, going up again? Yeah, my internet's full speed. Three 330 down. Well, of course, you would need the up speed. Um, John, I wonder if you being connected is doing something. Me? No, Suncast. No, I actually, this is the first time I've ever tested my internet. It's got what I'm paying. For. It's as high as it can be. Um, can you do me a favor? Can you try reconnecting? Something's going me? on here. Yeah. I, I think it's a software okay. issue. It's not you, your internet per se, but. It's weird. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see if it goes up. I mean, you're sitting so now. It's 640 by 360, which is somewhat tolerable. Okay, I think it's coming up. Let's see. Let's get this baby going. Let's rev the engine a little bit. Okay. Yeah, 720p. Look at that. We're in business now. <laughs> so if you only knew how I'm doing video today, it's really wacky which I'll talk about on the show. How do I sound to you? Do I sound good? Yeah, you sound fine. Okay, cool. Um, let me raise the volume here. Okay. How does everybody sound? How does everybody look? Everybody's fine today? I just cannot hear myself, so that's a, that's a real big problem. But other than that, everything is fine, and I think we could start. We're tweeted. We're, we're everywhere. You posted everything everywhere. Okay. What year is this? 1999. <laughs> All right, Paul. You ready? Let's see. Yep. Okay. We have this to play, and we will start in three, two, and one. What the Tech is brought to you by Rocket Loans, part of the Quicken Loans family of companies. Offers personal loans from $2,000 to $35,000 by visiting rocketloans.com slash what the tech. That's rocketloans.com slash what the tech. Butcher Box. For two free filet mignons, free bacon, and $20 off your order, go to butcherbox.com slash Andrew and enter Andrew at checkout. Go now. This is over a $50 value and available for a limited time only. Hey, 
Hey everybody, welcome to What the Tech. I'm Andrew Zarin, of course, I'm joined by my best friend in life, Paul Therod. How you doing, Paul? <laughs> Pretty good. How are you? Uh, so last week we did not do a show. So this week mm -hmm. we are doing a funky, funky setup to get you guys the video. Um, I guess I could explain it uh, because people really like the technical aspect of this and how we've kind of mm -hmm. rigged the setup. So we have a very sophisticated audio system here at the studio. It, mm -hmm. It's it's all IP based. It's it's all mix minus, and and it's all. I mean, it's it's very overly complicated. If if you're not an audio guy, you're not going to really care about it. But uh, if you are, I could go into detail another time. But so we use IP audio notes. So essentially, it's a router, right? A node for our audio for our mix minus. This thing has been overheating for about three years, <laughs> and finally, it uh it, it decided that it was no longer going to work. And the whole thing died. So I had to get it repaired. Obviously, it's not an easy repair to make because you got to find some guy that knows how to work on this thing. Luckily, it's a power supply. It's only costing me $1,000, Paul, to fix. It's mm -hmm. only a grand to fix, you know, sure. not that not nothing crazy. So uh, right now they ordered the part and it came in and it was the wrong part. So right now, the way that we're doing this video is nuts. I'm in my studio, but imagine if I wasn't because I'm doing the show over over uh, vmix call, which is a uh, an IP-based WebRTC client. So I'm calling in to the machine here through my laptop, and Paul's calling in to into that machine, and then now we've combined our love for each other right here for you. This is how we're doing the show. It, it's really uh, funky. Uh, I have to get used to the timing because Paul and me have this weird latency thing going on right now. But yep. Uh, we're never we'll, in sync, Andrew. I feel like we're just never on the same page anymore. We're never on the same page anymore. But we do have a lot to talk about. So I do want to, I do want to, you know, do a show and get it out there. But uh, I guess on the post show, I could kind of go into detail about how I'm doing this. Uh, it is mm -hmm. really wacky and amazing how technology has simplified things to the point that I don't even need to use all this stuff. You know what I mean? I don't even have to use any of this. I'm just calling in through my laptop and it's probably it's not as good but it's good enough right you've been made redundant yeah but do you think it's i mean it's good enough right my video i can't tell any difference it's it okay. seems normal to me good if paul can't tell the difference most people can't either because paul is a very judgy man and he sees everything i'll get well, a pimple he'll tell I, me i look terrible you do have kind of a helmet hair thing going on today but i do i don't I um do. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, it's not clear to me that I see the same thing that people watching see, but it seems normal yeah. to me. Yeah. So we do have a lot to talk about, obviously. I did notes, Paul. I don't know if you saw this, but I did notes you the know first what? time in a while. I did see that you did notes. I have not looked at the notes, but let me look at the notes. Yeah, right I, um, I do want to talk about my experience with installing Windows for the first time in a mm -hmm. while. Uh, and, and I kind of want to go into the PC market and the slowdown and growth. And kind of attributed to a couple of the things that I'm incorporating here at the studio because, you know, even though we use computers a little bit differently because we're power users, mm -hmm. like most of our audience, but I use it on a production level. I got used to replacing things every three years, generally, and now I'm not really doing that as much. And I kind of want to talk about that and, and see if that slowdown in PC growth really has to do with essentially everybody and everything happening in the PC market, not just power users or, or the average user. And a whole lot more stuff, obviously, I want to talk about. Uh, we do have a ton of stuff to get to because we did not do a show last week. But before we continue, I want to thank our new sponsor, and that's Rocket Loans. Personal loans made simple. Visit rocketloans.com slash what the tech. So imagine this, right? The holidays are uh, passed. You got credit card bills. You're purchasing new furniture for your new house, or you're making updates to your existing home like I just did. Uh, I remodeled my entire kitchen. Uh, part of the Quicken Loans family of companies, Rocket Loans offers you personal loans from $2,000 to $35,000. So regardless if it's you know one piece of furniture or you're doing a whole remodel, they uh, they offer the loan. By visiting rocketloans.com slash what the tech, you could check out the offers at any time without harming your credit score, which is a huge plus. You don't want you don't want to sign up for a service that does the whole credit check and then there's a ding on your credit. Uh, with Rocket Loans, it's simple, it's rocket fast, and uh, online process. You could combine your credit card bills in one monthly fixed rate. Uh, it's very easy, very seamless. Also, uh, I'm a big fan of their service, and you know anything that makes this kind of stuff easy is uh, is, an is okay in my book, obviously. Uh, Rocketloans.com slash what the tech. All loans are made by Cross River Bank member FDIC. Paul, 
Yes, sir. Let's begin with uh, I want to talk about Xbox Live uh, yeah. because you had a, you had an article on Therat.com, and I also saw a lot of people posting this. And you and Brad obviously went into detail about Xbox Live everywhere and the future of Xbox yeah. Live as a service. Um, you know, we're not tied to hardware anymore as much as we used to be even two, three years ago. Uh, things are right. changing. Microsoft's initiative as a whole is content uh, software on every platform. It doesn't matter if it's Mac or PC. And this logic is potentially spreading over to the Xbox side, where you could potentially have Xbox Live on your iPad, theoretically. Yeah. So go into well, detail. I'm uh, curious about I mean, this. You, you will. I mean, you definitely will. So um, Xbox Live has always had little tendrils out past the Xbox. You know, there was a They've called it different things now. It's just Xbox Live, but we've had it on Windows since, I don't know, right before Windows Vista ship, probably something like that. Remember Halo 2 came out on Windows Vista at the time, and it was, I think they called it Games for Windows or something, but it was it was the mm -hmm. Xbox Live thing. You get achievements and all that stuff. Um, I believe even today there are a handful of games that are Xbox Live powered on the iPhone. I could be wrong about that, but I think there are, like little Microsoft games. Um, and so the question here is not whether um, Xbox Live is coming to other platforms or the screens, I guess we'll call it, but uh, but what form it will take, right? So we know that Microsoft has something called xCloud. It's going to be in public testing sometime this year. It's a cloud delivery system for a gaming service uh, that it will be heterogeneous in, in nature, meaning you can use it on a PC an iPad, an iPhone, an Android phone. My iPhone thinks I'm talking to it. Um, whatever, right? Probably other things. Over time, I could imagine it would come to Roku and smart TVs and whatever. So we know this is happening. And there is no doubt that part of this expansion of Xbox Live to other screens is part of that initiative. But the broader question is whether they intend to expand Xbox Live beyond that, right? To uh, actual uh, native games on iOS or Android or wherever else um, beyond uh, the Kindle. I'm sorry, not the Kindle. <laughs> not the Kindle. Sorry. Uh, I would, you the, know what, Paul? I would pay money to get, to get Xbox Live yeah, on yeah. my Kindle. Just wait for it to render on that terrible grayscale screen. Um, the Switch, I meant. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'll see. I, 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 I don't expect to see too much there. We don't actually know if that's going to be part of it. I believe it's mostly or all about this future service. And, okay, so and that's here, why you need, you need that there. Okay, so mm -hmm. let, let's theoretically say Xbox Live on, on the Switch, right? You know the Switch can yep. handle uh, games, essentially. You could, you could, you could use yeah. it to some extent. But as far mm -hmm. as when we're talking about a, Yo a, a, a Yoku, a Roku, uh, a Roku or an Apple TV, a lot of the yeah. problems that, that you may encounter will not be on the Microsoft side, but there'll be hardware-based limitations on Roku's side. How will that impact yeah. business for them? Because they can't guarantee that you're going to have a great experience or, or a consistent experience. Well, actually, one thing they could do is work on a rev of the Xbox controller that does work on all those platforms, right? So we know that, I don't remember when it happened exactly, but the Xbox One controller today supports Bluetooth. Oh, geez, Bluetooth. Right, not just Microsoft's proprietary Xbox streaming technology for uh, game controllers. That enables it to work seamlessly with computers. It could absolutely make it uh, work seamlessly with mobile devices, with Roku, with whatever, right? Um, maybe you'll need a wire. A lot of those devices have a, a USB port. Uh, and I know the Roku does, and I'm not sure about the, I wouldn't be surprised if the, I bet the Apple TV does too, but. Well, Fire TV um, also has a USB. Yeah, so you know these these platforms all support some form of controller, right? You can use a Roku remote where you turn it sideways. Um, I think third parties make uh, actual game controllers for the Apple TV. Uh, Amazon did, or been, probably still does, sell a, an Xbox-like controller for the Fire TV hardware. Um, you know, this stuff is out there. I mean, ideally, what you have is the Xbox controller, and ideally, what you would be able to do is start a game on your big screen with your Xbox One or whatever you might have, and then it's time to go to work, and maybe you're going to be in the, uh, um, you know, on a bus or a train or something, and you get your phone, and you can keep using that same controller, but now you're on the tiny screen, yeah. and you continue playing the same game. I mean, that's the theory, right? So, I mean, or, or, or if I have a Roku upstairs, and I want to go upstairs, and I just leave the Xbox on, I could, you know. Yeah. 
It's also, I should say, it's it's not always about portability either. It, it, it's not, although I, I think that will be, it will definitely be part of it, right? So the, the scenario I just sort of walked through is is one way. But honestly, for a lot of people, it, it's always been kind of goofy. Like you spend 250 to $500 on an Xbox and you put it in your living room and it's like, it's this big, giant, computer, powerful device with fans and, and high-end hardware and the thing's humming away under there. And you're using it to watch like Netflix, right? That doesn't make sense. It's like, it's a really inefficient way to do that. Um, some people are just going to want to use what they have. And so the idea is, I actually do want to take advantage of those games. I don't want to stick an Xbox in there. I don't have the ROM or I don't have the money or whatever it is. But I do have a smart TV or a Roku or a Apple TV, a Fire TV, whatever it might be, or an iPad, you know. And I just, what I want is an Xbox controller. And I want it to go to that screen. And that's what this is all about. You know, and I think that's what Xbox Live being on those platforms is all about as well. I think I think it's a great idea. How, how realistic or actually I know it's going to happen, but um, to what extent yeah. do you think it'll happen? You know, are we going to are we going to get it on Nintendo Switch? Are we going to see it on a PlayStation? Uh, well, you're probably not going to see it on the PlayStation, <laughs> so, but you'll probably see it just about everywhere else. Remember, you know, uh, at CES this past month, Apple announced uh, deals with a bunch of smart TV makers to bring uh, Apple, I'm sorry, um, not Apple TV, iTunes and AirPlay 2 to, to, to those devices, right? Um, I predicted at the time that they would go to Roku and other set-top boxes. We're actually, I, today, just today, some Apple site published, uh, the, the, it, there's a rumor that that's exactly what's going to happen. And you could kind of see Microsoft approaching gaming from the same perspective, you know? Get it out to as many screens as possible, whatever by whatever means necessary. Um, I think in the in the beginning, like this year, next year, whatever, um, without knowing the complete form that it's going to take, will it be one hundred percent streaming? Will it be some co uh, combination of streaming and caching? Will you be able to download content to the device to make it work better? We don't know one hundred percent, but um, you're going to have to you're going to want to have a pretty good internet connection, right? Obviously, it's not going to be a solution for everyone on day one obviously. But uh, I think that evolves over time. And so, you know, they're going down this path. We've, there are yeah. services that have done this, like on live, for example. Um, and it works, you know, I'm not did saying you it's use perfect. the online service. Um, yeah, very briefly, I did. It worked for me because I had really good at, at the time. I mean, I still have great internet, but I had Fios at yeah. the time. So my experience was really good. While most yeah. people that had, you know, five megabit upload or, or whatever three megabit upload at the time yeah, you know 10 yeah, years yeah. ago uh, it was absolutely terrible so um i know that it relied remember, big on that but yeah so on live evolved over time if i if i remember it correctly they had their own dedicated hardware at first and i think that's what i had and then i think over time uh, you could do it on different devices which probably made more sense you know whatever but um unlike on live this is not an all or one thing right microsoft's deal is always going to be, look, if you want the very best experience, uh, depending on what your definition of that is, you want to get an Xbox console or a Windows 10 PC, right? Windows 10 PCs can scale depending on the hardware to have better graphics than is even possible on a console and be more powerful, etc. Uh, Xbox consoles are really easy to set up and they just kind of work. And so that, you know, an, a computer could cost a thousand, three thousand, it could cost a lot. An Xbox is going to cost two fifty to five hundred dollars, depending on which one you get, and um, those are always available. And if you, that they, you can download the games, play offline. You can you have different capabilities. Um, but if you can stream, right, you have this other new. You'll have this other new option. It will be some kind of a subscription service. It will be monthly or yearly charge, and um, I think the experience is going to differ a little bit depending on the device. You'll probably have oh, big time. Uh, yeah, better experience on an iPad than you want on a Roku or something. And I don't even know if Roku is part of the equation. Let's just assume it will be at some point. Um, obviously, the lower end hardware is not going to work as well. But then again, a lot of this is happening up in the cloud anyway. So the client hardware doesn't matter as much. Yeah, I, I'm curious to see this because this is something that we've discussed uh, across the board. And, and listen, <laughs> and we're on the Xbox conversation, obviously, now because it's a big story. But I've always said that Nintendo would be a huge benefactor by allowing their i guess virtual console whatever they call it now right their switch store whatever whatever the yeah. name you know for the week is uh allowing that platform to be on other services 
obviously, uh, the Nintendo Switch has been a very successful seller for them. They, they It's unpredictably, right? Because uh, right. leading up to the Switch's release, almost everybody was saying that this may be Nintendo's last console, and this is it for them after the terrible sales of the Wii U. Um, and we've seen them, you know, time and time again, recover from this kind of thing. But something that is selling Nintendo, uh, something that's not the selling point for the Switch, is nostalgia games. Which a lot of people right. thought that that's the that's the big seller for Nintendo. I think they would benefit greatly by allowing their content on other platforms. Microsoft too. Listen, they have a tremendous library, you know, and and, and allowing somebody to use another yeah. device to access <clears throat> that or access their their at home console would be tremendous mm -hmm. for them. Uh, we're, we're we're seeing the shift of of ecosystems yeah. within other ecosystems. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, there's two sides to this. There's um, a lot of companies are working on the services. Uh, Apple's rumored to be working on a game service. Google is working on a game service. Amazon's rumored to be working on a service. I mean, anyone, any company that makes a platform, you know, they're going to kind of look at it. And then, sorry, I have like this, like a weird cat hair that refuses to get off of my eye. It's okay. Um, <laughs> you want me to hold it and blow it? Blow it and make a wish. <laughs> so... Um, it just, it keeps like flipping back into my eyesight or whatever. So on the flip side, of course you have the, the companies that actually make game consoles, right. Or, or have gaming platforms of their own. Sony is a big one, of course, uh, Nintendo, Microsoft, and then kind of to a lesser degree, I would say Apple, you know, has because of their developer base and the install base of their hardware that there's, there's probably a big game developer story there as well. Of course there is I mean, on the there Apple is, side. There, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it's so by that, the way, the Apple side is fascinating, right? Because you yeah. have a you have a platform. Uh, I mean, the iOS and and the App Store, they could potentially, arguably, be the number one uh, game ecosystem out there. They're the biggest, right. you know, game ecosystem technically because everybody's using their phones and they have <laughs> access to these games. But they have done That's such a poor job at executing it on the television. That was the hope with the new Apple TV. That's right. That's right. Um, I, there was a scary moment when they announced that where I thought, man, you know, they could steal this away from Microsoft and Sony mm -hmm. and Nintendo, I guess. Um, th there's always the chance for partnerships, but th these companies would be less likely to partner with anyone they see as a rival in that space, right? So even though Microsoft has a great infrastructure that I think would benefit any game company or game maker, uh, and we will probably see some something some deal some ea some activision some somebody uh some group of somebody's do deals with microsoft right um to get them to get their games delivered through azure or whatever um you know the sony microsoft apple nintendo linkups those are a little less certain um and it would almost i think you know from my, just from the microsoft perspective i couldn't imagine no matter how good uh amazon or sorry azure is that like Sony bases some future streaming service on Azure, <laughs> you know, like they're yeah, going to go yeah, with yeah. Amazon or they're going to go with their own, th you know, build their own thing out, whatever it is. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll see. I, I, it, there's a lot of players that are very interested in this and for good reason, you know, gaming is big business. It's much bigger than Hollywood movies, for example. And um, it, I think we've all, we, I, we all probably agree. It's not quite, it's not there yet. Technology wise for a lot of people, for most people, but it's definitely going in this direction, right? It's leaps and happen. bounds. Yeah, it's leaps and bounds ahead. I'm curious to see how this plays out because um, when you open up the relationship between you know companies like a Google and a Microsoft and an Apple, mm -hmm. it leads to other things. It's not yeah. just on this side, you know. Opening up Xbox Live access on an Apple TV or or iOS may seem minuscule for people that really don't game, but it also it, it's it's the relationship building that's happening. And that's how you eventually get messages, the, the iMessage app on Apple on a on, on a Windows based platform. And then I could be very happy and never use my Mac ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see that. I I I, I see um, enormous potential for meetups or matchups between Microsoft and Google and Microsoft and Apple as well. And unfortunately, <laughs> you know, when you look at these companies a little deeper. As much as I'd love to think that this stuff could happen, and I really do, I would love to see this stuff happen. It just seems less likely. You know, for Apple, for example, is the uh, biggest electronics company on earth by far. They have so much money. You know, they're building out incredible infrastructure in the form of data centers all over the world just to support their own platform. You know, when Microsoft builds out 
infrastructure for Azure. It's to support like all these partners and companies you know, or customers they have. Apple's infrastructure is just for Apple. That's it. And uh, it's enormous, you know, and so yeah. they may not have um, the innate capabilities of Microsoft when it comes to this kind of stuff, but they do have the capacity and the money to make it happen. And so they may be less likely to team up with Microsoft. That said, there's a business case to be made. Apple has got a little problem, you know, and that problem takes many forms, but it's Android and Chrome OS and it's this other stuff. And Microsoft very open to working with both sides of that fence, but they could help Apple out in in areas that I think are important. Apple in turn could give Microsoft some stuff that would make the iPhone a better experience for Microsoft centric users. And you just know they're never going to do it. Like you just know yeah. they will never give up that control, no matter how much it might benefit their business otherwise. Because it takes you yeah. out of the ecosystem even slightly. And, uh, you know, that that's the yeah, and Yeah. A Apple is also, you know, here's this is, this is going to seem like it's a little uh, off topic, but it's, it really is just at the heart of what Apple is all about. You know, Apple is the biggest bully in tech in many ways. And Apple is um, embroiled in a uh, loss, a, set, a, a massive set of lawsuits, really, with Qualcomm, right? Apple is um, a, probably a thousand times bigger than Qualcomm, but Qualcomm has one huge advantage. Um, they make these major um, mobile OS chipsets, especially for things like modems and communication that are vastly superior to what Apple can get elsewhere. Um, Apple has a sweetheart deal on um Qualcomm's modems where they get them for and I think it's like one third the price that everyone else pays and yet they demand a lot more support than anyone else gets and so Qualcomm has never come back and said look you need to start paying more but what they have said is um, you know you, you can't keep going to our competitors for chipsets if you're going to use this stuff at this price you know we want some kind of guarantee that you, our stuff will be in at least 50 percent of your devices and uh, Apple has said no to that, and they're suing each other in court. And what kind of comes out is the stuff that Qualcomm is trying to sell to Apple costs a dollar fifty per iPhone per in, in a one thousand dollar iPhone. It's point one five percent of the cost of the phone, and they're yeah. fighting it. They purposely made Qualcomm modems slower, so they worked as slow as the crappy Intel modems they were also using because they like to have multiple sources. But the reason I bring this up is that. What they're really trying to do is cut those guys out. So today, Apple is working with Intel to fight Qualcomm. Um, they're doing that while Intel is racing to try to make their modems better. But you know that Apple being Apple, because they've done this so many times, is also working on its own modem chipsets. And once they're able to make their own, they're going to cut off Intel too. Yeah, you're gone. They don't, yeah, want, they don't want anyone in the iPhone that's not them. And that's... The reason I bring this up because ultimately the end game for Apple is control over everything. And they feel that that's the only way they can be successful and differentiate ultimately is if everything they do is, is all Apple as possible. They're not, they cut off uh, partners at the knees. They steal ideas from uh, their own customers. In many cases of software that they just outright stole from the Mac community or the iPhone community, put it right into their own products. Um, they will do this to Intel. And that's the problem for the Microsoft link up. We were kind of dreaming about I mean, ultimately, uh, if they ever do put iMessage on uh, Windows or on Android or whatever, they're only doing it because they kind of have to, they're forced to. But the end game there is we really don't want that there. And they'll take it away like they took away Safari on, you know, Windows or, you know, it, it's, you should never trust that that's always going to, you know, be a thing. They want you to buy their stuff. Yeah, of and course. And, and it really comes down to how much money they can make by putting their stuff on your platform. You know, when yeah. you look at Safari, Safari was not making them money on Windows. Um, but, yeah, but an iMessage on Windows or an iMessage on Android, they could. Uh, they, there is a way to monetize that. And, and I was thinking about this and I'm, I'm almost positive this is what's going to happen. They're going to have it on there. And in order to yeah. get certain emojis and certain GIFs and certain, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, whatever's. Uh, <laughs> you're going to have to pay three ninety nine for or $1.99 or 99 cents or 50 cents. They're going to monetize this. And I'm telling you, they're going to make a freaking killing. Well, I think the, the way they monetize it is do, they'll do it if it makes sense to keep, make, keep the iPhone successful, right? If they had heard from enough people that they were like, look, I really like this notion that you have of a uh, handoff or whatever they call that. We kind of go back and forth between devices. I can send text messages from a Mac and get them, you know, get the notifications on my iPad. I love that stuff. 
but I use a PC and I want to do it there. Um, if there was enough complaints, right, about that kind of thing, they would put it, they would put it there, right? Because it would benefit the iPhone. You know, that's why they put iTunes on Windows, right? Because it, it would help to sell iPods in the sure. beginning and then iPhones, you know. Um, I don't know. You can never trust that kind of thing. It's not a good partnership. It's just, it, it's a very one-sided deal. It always will be. They're never going to change. I got I, a question I, for I you. Here's yeah. a question. Do you think the iPod did more for Mac sales than the iPhone did? Um, I don't think either one of them <laughs> did much for Mac so? sales, to be honest. No, and the reason being that the iPod didn't take off until they put it on Windows, right? They put, you know, well, first it was some kind of music match thing, I think, and then eventually they, they brought iTunes to Windows. Um, the, iPod the reason why I say the, that was failed until yeah but the reason why i say that is that the ipad was the first apple device that many people that i know had and then that brought them into Uh, you mean ipad or ipod 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 yeah i feel like the ipod brought you into the ecosystem a little bit it brought you in the apple side and then the ipod and then the ipad eventually brought you into the mac side Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the iPod, especially when they made multiple versions and some of them were very cheap, right. Was a way to get, it was like, you know, I can't afford a Lamborghini, but look, they, they sell a scooter and I can afford the scooter and it's <laughs> the quality of the, you know, and it was kind of a way to get a taste of that, um, at a lower price. And I, and the idea there is that they would have switchers as a result. And I'm sure there was some of that for sure. But, um, you know, I mean, windows, market share slash usage share has not changed dramatically over the years. Um, so they really didn't steal away a bunch of customers. I mean, it, I, I think we saw whatever that plateau was. Like at one point, Apple and Mac probably hit somewhere 7 8% use, you know, I don't know if it was market or usage share or whatever. Um, it never really went beyond that. And so yeah. I think that was it. I think that what it's they saw was like they got what they could get, you know. Yeah. But I see more, way more and more Macs um, in the wild than I did, you know, six, yeah, seven, but you live eight in New York years City. ago. Maybe um, that's it. Yeah. Maybe. No, I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, I just, you got to be careful with the, your kind of personal experience. If you go to San Francisco, you would think that Apple controls the entire planet. You know, it is a sea of white earbuds and iPhones and MacBook Airs. And, you know, it, it, that's, of course, it's like that. Um and, you know, I, there are places, I mean, when I look, when I travel, I look at what people are using on the plane. There's, I don't know what you could take away from that. You know, people can afford to fly, you know, or either businessmen or, you know, uh, affluent or whatever. Affluent people tend to have Apple products and business people tend to have ThinkPads, you know, I, you know, whatever. You see, you see these devices out in the world. Um, I don't know. You see, I, I think they're popular in schools for sure. Maybe not as much as they used to be. Um, but the numbers don't lie. I mean, there were only, you know, yeah. is, what are there, 100 million Macs out in the world or something? I mean, there were yeah, 1.5 I mean, million PCs. I mean, the plan, I mean, obviously, it's get you on the iPhone side and then have the schools have iP- iPhone, um, iPhones, geez, too, too many names, have MacBooks yeah. and MacBook Airs. And then eventually you become an adult. And then you say, well, look, I want to buy a Mac. And I don't know how much, how well that's turning out. I think what's happening is that you're be- these kids are becoming adults and saying, I don't need a computer. Right. I think that's really well, what but Apple's there for them too, right? Yeah, uh, yeah you can have your iPad. They have an iPad Pro now, and you know, well, yeah. just an iPhone. I mean, most people, you yeah. know, that obviously, I want to obviously I want to continue this, but we do need to take a minute and talk about my my new favorite sponsor, uh, and that's ButcherBox. This is a great offer they're offering our listeners. If you go to butcherbox.com/slash/andrew, you get two free filet mignons, free bacon. And $20 off your order by going to butcherbox.com slash Andrew. And you put an Andrew at the checkout. That's over $50 in value, but for a limited time only. So this is only happening for a short period of time. So this is awesome. So Jess, I don't, did you do the primal diet, Paul? Were you doing the primal bl- blueprint diet no. or no? You were doing, but you were doing like a meat-based diet. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I was doing a, I guess I would call it a, like a low carb keto diet, which low is carb a lot keto of diet. fat and, and protein. Sure. So Jess is doing the primal blueprint diet and she's down about, I want to say 11, 12 pounds since mm-hmm. starting it. Um, and it's all meat based, you know, no, very little carbs, uh, or almost no carbs, no sugar. And ButcherBox has been a humongous part of this. 
because all I'm doing is cooking meat. So the way that it works, you could you could either curate your own box or you could let them do it. Uh, a mixed box would be high quality beef, chicken, pork, uh, or you could customize it if you just want beef or you just want chicken. It depends on how you want it. Uh, the meat is frozen frozen at peak freshness in an individually vacuum sealed bag. It's biodegradable. Uh, each box is shipped with careful careful calculation for the amount of dry ice. So this is really cool. doesn't matter if you're in Arizona in the middle of the summer or you're in New York uh, in the middle of winter. They know how to pack the dry ice so it stays at peak conditions if it's sitting outside for a little bit. So you don't have to freak out if it shows up, uh, which is absolutely great. The meat is delivered right to your doorstep for free. Uh, each each box is delivered. Uh, the meat is grass-fed, grass-finished beef, free-range organic chicken, and heritage-bred pork. Uh, this is all great stuff. So last night I made filet uh, two nights ago, and it was phenomenal. I mean, it was unbelievable. I just defrosted. I thawed out. I followed the instructions on how to do that, and... Uh, I made it for Jess. Jess goes, oh, my God, where'd you get this? And I said, it was Butcher Box. It's the, it's the shipment that we got. So it's absolutely awesome. I love these guys, and you guys should check it out. And also, um, I, I want to get Jess to talk about this. Maybe she could tell me a little bit more about what made her go down this diet path, because she's not really a meat eater. Um, she did vegetarian for a couple of years, which was crazy. Uh, and now that's all she's doing is eating uh, steak and chicken and, you know, just doing a high uh, high meat diet. And it's working great for her. Uh, again, the offer is phenomenal. It's two free filet mignons, free bacon, and $20 off your order by going to butcherbox.com slash Andrew. Explore the site to learn more. They have got great stuff over there, and uh, we're big fans of them. Paul, a box of meat. How could you uh, not like this? Sure. Uh, I got a couple questions for you, Paul. Any news on the Microsoft webcam uh, project that we broke here on What the Tech? Nope. I have not heard anything. Okay. The last we heard that the code name was Aruba. Yeah, there's project. two versions, like the PC version and the version that will be on Surface Hub 2. Oh, so the one that, so what I said was absolutely right, huh? Amazing. I pat <laughs> myself I on the back on this one. Uh, since we were on the, to the topic of, you know, kind of putting your mm -hmm. content on other places uh, with the Xbox conversation, I did want to talk about the Super Bowl a little bit. By the way, congratulations, mm -hmm. Paul. Uh, you guys played an absolutely terrible game, but luckily for the Patriots, well, they played even So I'm, I'm, I take a, <laughs> I take great exception uh, to this complaint that I see all over the place that that, that either one of these teams <laughs> played a terrible game. It no, was I mean, a I really defensive do. game. It was a defensive game. Well, no, no, that's okay. Yes, I, okay, yeah, uh, fair enough. But um, I, look, a lot of the Patriot Super Bowl victories have been nail baiter, last second victory type things. Um, this was a this ten point differential. I didn't look this up, but this might have been their biggest victory ever in a Super Bowl, <laughs> like by points. I, I, someone should look that up, but I think it is. Um, regardless, uh, I just want to say this about the Patriots since you brought it up. I wouldn't have normally said this, but um, there, obviously there are all these great sports dynasties. And if you look at the 18 years over which they've been in the Super Bowl nine times and won six of them, um, you can look at any other city in the country. And there are some that have maybe four or five championships across different sports. And, uh, you know, the Red Sox have won four times. The uh, Bruins and the Celtics have both won once. The Patriots have won six times. It's not even close. But when you look at, like, sports, um, the, the, what the Patriots did and are doing is unprecedented, right? You know, there are Celtics teams like the Celtics won uh, the championship, you know, 11 out of 13 years over a span from the 60s and the early 70s. But that team didn't suffer from the same limitations that are available are, are enforced in the NFL today. The yeah. NFL is designed for parity, right? When you win a lot of games, you get a crappy schedule next year and low draft picks. That's how this works. It's designed so that there are no repeat winners, right? Yeah. What you should see over 18 years is a bunch of different teams winning the championship and then like one or three or five where over that span, maybe some of them win twice. That's what you should see. That's statistically how that should work out uh that the patriots were able to rack up the single greatest sports dynasty in history during a time period in which they were pushed on in every way imaginable is what makes what happened this past week well i have to tell you uh, so i'm a new york giants fan um yeah. it's actually a uh, day from hot hardware post and i saw a lot of people post this but this is just such yeah. a kicking the nuts a four-month-old baby in boston has seen more championships than a 45-year-old mets jets uh, knicks fan combined yeah oh no I, listen uh, this is the 
dating back years ago, I had said to my son who grew up, you know, born in 1998 uh, and grew up with the Patriots winning all the time. The Red Sox started winning. Celtics won, you know, the Bruins won. Uh, Star Wars movies came back. Indiana Jones came back. I was like, dude, you're living a magical life. This does <laughs> this is not. I, I've been waiting since the 80s for everything that has happened to you. And it has all happened in a span of like five to seven years. This is bullshit. <laughs> You know, and like, and you know, he just doesn't understand. You know, he's like, this is yeah. the way it always is. It's like, no, it, it isn't. We're just winners. Yeah. Life's yeah. about yeah. winning. Your team it's, always wins. It is, it is not what it is. I mean. I, I have to tell you. I, so Brady, I, and, and I know we, we're we going to get back on the subject here. And there was a point to this. Mm -hmm. But Tom Brady has to be the greatest quarterback of all oh, time. At this point. He has years to be old. the greatest sports player of all time. I don't period. care what you say. 42 period. years old. This guy. Yeah. It, it, this he was down and out, right? They were saying, "Is this Belichick's and Brady's last year?" And are they gonna? The guy is. He did. Did he play the best game he's ever played? Absolutely not. No, but did, did you play see better him than throwing the ball? Yes. Did you see him yeah. throwing the ball? The guy's. The guy is is you know? is engineered to be the best. Yeah. Um, There's a great I, I breakdown say, they did in the sorry in the New York Times where they were talking about the two most pivotal passes of the game and how they went right or wrong. And one was the Rams threw and got intercepted late in the game. And the ball was just underthrown. You know, it was just bad, badly thrown, period. There's a great diagram of how it kind of went down. And then they've got a, an even longer pass that Tom Brady threw to Gronkowski that was perfect. And he was covered by three different guys. Granted, he's yeah. a monster. He's a huge person. But uh, being big in the NFL is not an excuse. <laughs> Everyone in the NFL is big. Um, I That's the difference right there. By the you way, know, Gronk's you going into throw it perfectly or you don't. And it has to come from the quarterback. And his ability to impact that team through a roster that has changed continuously. He's the only guy that's yeah. been on every single one of these teams. The only one uh, is astonishing. You know, Kobe Bryant or LeBron James or Larry Bird or I'm trying to think who else is good. Michael Jordan. You know, whatever. Michael could Jordan. Not, Michael Jordan. Uh, well, could Michael not single-handedly. Well, he's not the exception, actually, because he had a core cast of characters. Only did it over a six-year span, really. And... He, he he is. It's not like Jordan was the one. You can't say Jordan was the one guy who was on all those teams. He wasn't, <laughs> and yeah. that's that's the big difference. I think it's amazing. It's fascinating. Um, those are all yeah, they're all is. amazing. Don't get me wrong. Jordan is. I mean, my God, of course. But I mean, if you have to make a choice, like the single best, I don't think you can make a choice otherwise. Yeah, it's I, I have to tell you, it it takes a lot for and and people. I think a lot of people realize at this point how how great Tom Brady is. But yeah. this was my point before before yeah, we, we veer off into <laughs> we're a little defensive up here in the in the page. I get it. I get it. I totally get it. I totally get it. Um, it was interesting to see how the NFL and, and CBS essentially are giving the show away for free everywhere, right? Everywhere. Yeah, right. Um, I saw that. So it didn't. So I was actually doing a little bit of digging on this. No matter what device you were on, so whether it was a Roku, a Apple TV. A Fire TV. An there was a banner an ad, and an iPhone. There was a banner yeah. ad essentially on all those right. platforms saying, "How this is how you can watch the Super Bowl for free. You don't have to yeah. pay. Just download this app and you watch it for free." Well, I thought that was really interesting. The aggressiveness of giving it away like yeah. that was the fascinating. Smart, the, me. I mean, of course, most of the people they're reaching have a way to watch the Super Bowl, right? You know, they have a TV probably or some TV service, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I, I it was a good effort. Um, I also, for whatever it's worth, I, I thought it was kind of fascinating that two things kind of tech related about the Super Bowl and the commercials is. 80 or 75 percent of the ads featured robots for some reason right it was really weird like everyone noticed it who i watched the game with we were talking like why are there so many robots but the other one is that you know obviously every year with the super bowl the ads are kind of hit or miss and and, and usually most of them are pretty terrible and then there's a handful that kind of you know do well or are you know funny or whatever it is but it seems like some most of the better ads were actually kind of tech industry ads right like the um the Amazon ad with uh, Harrison Ford was hilarious, and that yeah. I played it eighteen times. And then uh, the Microsoft ad about the accessibility controller that they have with it was wonderful. You know, it's really yeah. nice. Yeah, I, I thought that those were um, two of the stronger ones. I, but it was interesting. You know, this this speaks volumes because I, I think a lot of the giving it away on the app and being so forceful is that they're realizing that um, the generation that's buying cable 
and the generation that's putting antennas <laughs> yep. on a TV. You know, even just, I mean, the by antennas, I don't mean literally rabbit ears. I mean the, that that little plastic piece that you put, put up. Um, you, yeah. it, that is work for people for an entire generation. Having that is work and an effort, but to download yeah. an app and not even have it log in and just watch it on any of your devices anywhere. Right. Um, well, this is a key. This is a key numbers game for obviously the NFL. But it's about advertising, isn't it? I mean, ultimately, Absolutely. what they're doing is saying it's this is Google's model. You know, the ads are paying the bills. We want to get those ads in in, fr in front of as many people as possible. That makes them even more valuable to the advertisers. And next year they know, go up another twenty percent. Yep, uh, Super Bowl advertising is astronomically expensive. I, I do have to wonder about the NFL though, because there's a great case to be made that this league won't be around in 10 years, you know, um, that uh, they might reach a point where because of all these concussions, which are non-solvable, by the way, I don't care what kind of helmet they come up with. Your head is rattling around in a cage. It's going to, you're going to have a concussion. Um, they might actually reach a point where they can't uh, insure the league. Like there, there will be no company that will insure this. <laughs> and that, that might be the end of it. I mean, yeah. it's going to turn into flag football or something. They're going to play. By the way, the, the ratings, uh, the overnight ratings that came in on Monday, uh, yeah. it was the lowest Super Bowl in 10 years, the lowest rated Super Bowl. Now, that's not putting into account the DVR numbers, the, the yeah. P1 well, DVR numbers, and that's listen, not putting I mean, into account all the social media stuff. Uh, I, I'm not trying to be a dick about this, uh, but let's face it, uh, the Rams, seriously? I mean, I... I if you were to look at the league, I mean, the Patriots are, are a draw. Whatever you thought of them this season, I don't really care, but they are the Patriots, right? So it's whatever. But, you know, the New Orleans Saints, I think, would have been a big deal if they could have somehow played the uh, Philadelphia Eagles again. That would have been humongous, right? There there are certain teams that th that matchup would have been very exciting. And the L.A. Rams – you know, no offense to the fans they may have out there or whatever, but I, like seriously. Well, I, I the article, the problem. article that I read actually was saying a New York Times actually had the story where they were saying that the ratings were low because, uh, you know, the Patriots were America's team for a while, mm -hmm. and now the Saints are America's team, and there was a giant really? rebellion of Saints fans that said, "Screw this, I'm not watching it." I don't. That's not true. This, there is no one on earth who <laughs> believes that the Saints are America's team. <laughs> that's crazy. The New I Orleans was, Saints. Yeah, the New no, Orleans Saints. Yeah, it, it's America. They're, they're, they're awesome. I and I don't. I don't mean this as a slag on the team, but that's ludicrous. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, uh, and they are, are, were arguably the best team yeah. in the league this year. So anyway, so I want to I want to talk about that model a little bit. You know, the the fact that the yep. Super Bowl, the biggest the biggest uh, sporting event in in America essentially, right? Yep. Not worldwide, because that's obviously the World Cup, and, and there's plenty mm -hmm. of soccer games that do tremendous numbers worldwide. But the fact that they gave it away everywhere, um, I see this model being something that we see more and more yep. uh, amongst amongst all different types of shows, not just sporting events, but with debut episodes of shows um, to kind yeah, of entice yeah. you into for the ad yeah. revenue, because a lot of this is that ad revenue is down for TV, uh, because right. people are not watching TV. So what's happening is if you are a first run series uh, of, I don't know, whatever, I, I, I need a show uh, on regular television. Not a... Sure. Big Bang Theory, right? Big shows. Bang Theory. Yeah. Big Bang Theory. If, let's say Big Bang Theory is the best show in the world and, and it's it's the biggest ad driven, which I think it is. I think actually advertising wise, it's one of the top ones. Mm -hmm. You need, and the numbers are going down for television. Like how many people watch this show? I want, if, I want to say 10 million. Yeah. So you know what? Let me guess. I'm the, gonna look the it up. Top, the top five to ten shows on Netflix, and some number of the top shows on Amazon and Hulu, all attract anywhere from two to five times that audience. All of them, and um, this that is that's all you need to know about what's going on with TV. You know, the the TV that people talk about today is not the Big Bang. No one's going to work. Hey, did you see the funny joke on the Big Bang Theory last night? Th okay, this so conversation I think it does not occur. I well, think it's second, been like but, 12 to 14. All right, still nothing compared to what you see on these uh, services. Um, the big got to see it TV stuff today is The Handmaid's Tale. It's House of Cards back before Kevin Spacey jumped off a cliff. It's uh, Game of Thrones, which is on HBO, right? This is the stuff that people are getting excited about on TV. 
Yeah, The Walking Dead had it for a little while. It's kind of dragged on for too much, and everyone's dead now. But um, it's not those shows. I mean, we you could I, I'd have to look it up. I don't like most people. I don't watch most of this stuff. But um, I, there is no you know water cooler discussion about the Big Bang Theory. There just isn't. There's no one. No, we're not. No one is walking around talking catchphrases from these characters, or you know, it's it's the type of thing like a sheep watches. It's just, yeah, it's just nothing. It it happens and it's over, and you're like, I spent it. I spent thirty minutes. It's fine. I also also what's what's happening is that um, they're realizing, you know, who's the demo that's watching? Like this is us, right? This yeah. is us as a humongous hit on TV. My wife loves that show. All my wife's friends love that show. That show does really, about the Big eight Bang million. Theory. No, no, no. This is us. Oh, okay. <laughs> This like, is really? not the Big Bang. No, not the Big Bang thing. But this is us. Uh, it's doing about nine million, eight to nine million viewers per week, and that is a major success for cable. What What's their Hulu numbers? What's their you know when they when they go into Netflix? All right. What's the numbers going to be over there? I, I, I'm going to look this up. So let me see if I can find this because I don't remember the like the marvelous Miss. You know the name of this thing, marvelous. Yeah, it's, it's a good show. Yeah. It was just a story about this in the New York Times. Um, the, over 40 million people watched that. 40. Yeah, phenomenal. Well, phenomenal. <laughs> That's killing the show that you just said was the best show on TV, or the most watched t show on TV. I mean, yeah, but you know that's, what? Nobody cares. That's you know why? The problem. There's no ad revenue. Where's the ad revenue? Right. But no, but you're paying for the, the service, right? It's not what I'm saying is that model. The, the TV, uh, you, the Super Bowl is tr having to try something different to get the numbers up, right? On TV, it's it's kind of shifted to these, uh, I don't know what you call this. What do you call these? We used to call them like, it was like premium TV shows, right? Like if you watched a series on HBO, like back in the day, like Deadwood or Rome, you know, there were only, you know, a handful of them. Now there's like, you go to Netflix and you don't even know what to watch. And you know like what the ratings like were? You... For? For like, let's say Sopranos. Let's say Sopranos, right? Huge mega yeah. uh, premium Huge. HBO hit, yeah. right? Uh, I still right. watch it in reruns constantly. Their ratings were like 3 million people. 2 yeah. million, 4 but million that people. That probably drove a lot of, I know, but that, that was kind of boutique TV back then, right? So HBO, uh, for them, that was probably big business. You know, today, HBO is a minor player in this stuff. I mean, if it wasn't for... Game of Thrones, they wouldn't even be in this discussion, and that's ending. And they're trying to make another one because they, you know they 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 see that this is basically it for them. Um, I don't know. I I there are shows on Netflix that are just um, well, we've stopped watching TV. Like I, we, I, you know, that's just us. I mean, that doesn't mean the whole world has, but I mean, I think the whole world has. You know, like when I was a kid, like there were three channels. Plus, like a you know a PBS station and a couple of channels on UHF, like channel you know local channels. Um, we all watched the same stuff. It didn't kind of matter how good or bad it was. You know, if Friday night we'd watch Dallas or whatever. We watched terrible shows like Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. Um, today, those shows well, actually there are shows just like that today. So never mind. But um, but they wouldn't be the thing that everyone watched because now we have eleven hundred choices. Like you, I spend so I sometimes my wife will go out or should be doing something they have a couple hours to kill i'll watch the youtube like on the tv which still feels vaguely dirty to me <laughs> you know it's a little weird like here's a six minute video about van halen now i'm going to watch a documentary about a horror movie it's like the stupidest collection of stuff but it's just kind of uniquely youtube i don't know by the way let me let me correct what i said the rating yeah. the rating was a, a a three or four or five the actual viewership mm -hmm. of the soprano was more along the lines of 11 million yeah which back in that day what was that twenty years ago? Twenty years. That's tremendous. Twenty, 20 years ago for that's for premium. Amazing. Yeah, for pre premium. Yeah, and channel. if you look at right, and if you look at HBO and its comparable shows, not that there were any on Cinemax or Stars, or whatever the other stations are, that was probably the runaway. That was probably the one that. That's probably the reason we have what we have today. I, I assume some people looked at that and they were like, "Look, this thing is like a movie that runs over a season, and there are multiple seasons, and it's amazing." And yeah, it's a little expensive to make because it's you know a lot of people, a lot of characters, whatever. But my God, this could make big bucks. And now we have yeah. Netflix doing this, right? So, what was, here, what was Netflix when it first came out? Wasn't it a place to get B movies and direct to video movies? I think, <laughs> Basically, I think the big 
what was the big so for for a, I was reading an article about this and they mm -hmm. said the one thing that um the, the one I mean it, it there was many but like the one major thing that really helped Netflix mm -hmm. uh in in its in its initial pivotal boom was reruns of The Office and reruns of Arrested yeah. Development. Right. Those were yeah. the two. Yeah, yeah. That really they actually grow. picked up. They've done at least what two seasons now of Rest yeah. Development, I think. And I have to tell you, um, I I heard that Friends was a big deal for them as Friends well. Is, Friends is a big deal. Yeah, Friends or and Friends, Friends is a very unfunny, terrible show. <laughs> but don't say you know, that. Don't say that. Don't what, say what, that out uh, loud. You'll, you'll get beat up. I'm terrible, telling you, terrible. The, the Laverne and Shirley you. of the 1990s. No, the look, Joey Seinfeld Triviani was crew intelligent, excellent it. comedy. Friends was, you know, Friends. I mean, it was Friends. It's interesting. Um, I do want to. I do want to before we wrap up and go into our post show because I. I actually. I'm going to interview you on the bonus show, okay. guys. If you're watching live, I'm gonna. I do this once a year, and I and I ask Paul about his life and his career. And this is my favorite thing to do once a year is is kind of interview Paul because Paul and I do a show, but he's one of my favorite people to interview, which is strange, mm. uh, considering we're friends. Strange. Who interviews their friends? Uh, psychopaths, right. crazy people. That's who does that. Um, so if you're stay if you're watching this live, stay tuned. You can watch. We could, you can watch it live, absolutely. If you're watching this on demand or on a podcast form, go to patreon.com slash what the tech. You can fund us there as little as $1 per episode. That's $1 per episode. You can go to patreon.com slash what the tech. Hit the fun button and fund us there. Also, if you're on YouTube right now watching live, hit the subscribe button, first of all. Second, if you liked what we're doing and you're enjoying the show, there's a little dollar sign next to the chat. You can hit that dollar sign and fund us uh, $1, $2, whatever you want to fund us. You could go ahead and do that and helps, you know, the show go. And it's, by the way, the repair of that ridiculously expensive node you guys are paying for, which is unbelievable. You guys are the reason why we're going back on the air so fast after after a week or so. Uh, we're going to go live and uh, I, I'm going to talk to Paul about this. Uh, also, throughout.com, guys, go to throughout.com. Uh, Paul, I want to I want to talk about this. So something we're, since we're on the top subject of streaming media and obviously that's how everybody's accessing their content or, or most yeah. people, um, it is very important to have really good wi-fi in your house um i feel like i it, it sounded like i was going into an ad for a second but i'm not i swear to you uh right, and right. this is still a problem for many people is you know you they have you know they have a roku they have whatever like my father for mm -hmm. example he has a 4k tv and he has a roku 4k and he yep. has terrible wi-fi and i and i was helping him out i was like why, why does it look so i'm like this is a four. This is not 4K, and I'm looking. It's not enabling 4K because he has crappy Wi-Fi. Sure. And obviously, it took me like 30 minutes. I figured something out, and I got him to have a better connection. But I don't think a lot of people are are their, their connections are good. Like most people that I that I visit, their their routers are hidden away somewhere in a cupboard, covered with stuff, and, and they have no idea that they're not getting good connection. Like my mother-in-law is one of those people that it's like hidden away in yeah. the attic in a wall um i mean ideally if you could put it next to the tv and run a wire you'd be, that'd be, the you'd best. be better off yeah. especially if that tv is centrally located in your house you know so uh, part of what i'm doing like i started doing like speed tests in in all my rooms with all these uh you know smart mm -hmm. devices and i'm realizing that i i don't even have great signal going across <laughs> every room and so what yeah. i've done <laughs> I, I actually my routers are in this room right in the in the office and before it was it was it was fine it was good enough it was reaching everything and i have mm -hmm. a router on the third floor that i use uh for just in case if something goes bad you know i at least have another connection since i put these soundproof doors in because they're insulated i can't get a signal upstairs anymore it's blocking right. it so i'm in the process of you know figuring out how to how to do wi-fi in my house um okay. all across you know efficiently so i've gone down that path this week and I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to lay it out over the next couple of weeks, and I'm going to talk about how I'm doing this and what devices I'm going with, because I don't want to spend a lot of money. A lot of people suggested the Google Wi-Fi system, but it's yeah, that's not that's cheap. You're talking, you're talking like, oh, well, I guess it, well, fairly, it is inexpensive, right? Three of them are like 350 bucks. It's not that yeah. expensive. So I'm going to go as cheap and as good as possible. So my goal is to spend less than fifty dollars a router. Or fifty dollars a router, and mm -hmm. have at least three of them set up in my house, and I'm going to do a test to see uh, how good this possibly could be. Right. I mean, do you think it's possible? Are, no, but um, 
I, I think I'm, I personally, I think, and, and because it's what I do, so obviously it's right. No, but the, you know, <laughs> I stopped looking because I, I got something that worked for me. But the, I think a mesh networking system is great, and the one we have, which is the Google one, works for really well. Um, but there are other ways to do it. You know, you can do extenders and so forth. They have power line adapters. You can just plug stuff into a power port, have those stuff all around the house. Those little devices are probably pretty small. Um, but with your doors, you're going to want to do something that gets something outside of the doors, right? And so I got to get it outside I, of the door. Yeah. Then it's got to be connected with a wire. Um, yeah. So what I can do that thing, that thing becomes the basis for Wi-Fi that happens elsewhere. So what I can do. So my routers are here, right? Right over there. You can see them actually. They're yeah. lit. So I mm -hmm. could run it. I could run a wire through this wall yep. and it goes yep. out the room. Right. And then you mount and just have on it on the wall there. and then mount it on the wall. Yeah. Just mount yep. it right there. That's the, that's definitely the first step. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm going to do that. And then I'll begin my uh, my experiment here. Uh, I did. I was looking at some TP Link stuff, which I was mm -hmm. surprisingly suggested by someone that understands Wi Fi and, and networking. And he said, You really should mm -hmm. look at these because they're very inexpensive and the hardware is very good in them. They're doing really good hardware. The other problem that what I have, Paul. Of, what is it, though? Is it a mesh network or is it like um, just little nodes? It something? was a mesh network. It was a mesh network. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The other problem that I have, I have two separate internet lines in this house, I have two separate files lines. Mm -hmm. And. It's no longer necessary to do that, especially for what I'm doing. I have gigabit. You know, I have, I think I'm yeah, getting 980 yeah, yeah, yeah. by 1200. It would make more sense to have a second connection from a different carrier. Or the problem is like I'm afraid to, to cancel this line because if I cancel this second line, I wasn't supposed to get mm -hmm. it. BIOS, Verizon doesn't do two lines in one house. <laughs> Somehow I finagled them to do this. Now I'm paying $80 because I have fear of missing out. And I'm afraid that once I get rid of this, I won't ever be allowed to have another line just in case. Right. Well, yeah, a just in case line is unusual. But you should, um, I, I think it would, you'd be better off. I mean, if one goes down, they're both going to go down. Why not just have a... Uh... No, it, it, does, it doesn't work like that, really. Because they hit it on a different, um, I guess, a different node. It's coming in from this side of the block. And this one's coming in from this okay, side but, of the block. I mean, most Fios outages are not something that happens up the street. It's... N n yeah. I mean, I know. I mean, I, know you're I don't know. I, I, I'm debating what I'm going to do with this because do I, two lines is unnecessary. So what? Right now, yeah. what I've done, I and considering streaming has gotten so easy, like right now we just send one stream out, and then that does all mm -hmm. the distribution for us uh, through restream. We're not doing like 800 different streams anymore that I need all the bandwidth at, at with you know all the time. Yeah. Um, yep. I just need it for you know an hour or two a day, and that's it. So right now, the way that it's set up, all the TVs. Are connected to one network for streaming and then the other and then my my stuff is connected to one but it's it, it listen with a gigabit gigabit streaming it's really not necessary if you have a good router and it has a good nap pool and it's not getting flooded and it's able to handle I mean, multiple BIOS devices is, uh fios is a gig over a gig so that's amazing my connection here is only 330 down and two uh 20 up that's enough for this <laughs> i mean yeah. it's you know, I mean, we run, we do 4K over wireless. Uh, it's fine. I mean, I don't know. I don't think, I don't know. Yeah. So that's just an experiment that I'm trying. And then we'll uh, we'll continue with that over the next couple of weeks of what I do and how I do it. We'll, um, we'll yeah. see yeah. what's going on. Also, I, I want to tell everybody, uh, people are saying like, why don't you just run a wire? I had run a wire, okay? And for whatever reason, and I'm curious if this is a... Um, a, a, a issue amongst a lot of these devices. The, the chipset for the wired internet is not as good as the wireless. I'm able to get better speeds on wireless than I am with wired. And I've done this experiment. Uh, I did this on the Apple TV and I was shocked to see on the Apple TV when I wire the connection, I'm getting a lower yeah. speed than I am with the wireless. Well, yeah, but you know what? It's a more consistent and reliable speed. The, the problem with wireless is that it goes up and down. And I think there's a lot more latency and packet loss. I mean, it, 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 I don't know. I always go wired on the, my devices are right next to the router. So the Apple TV and the, the Roku both are wired. You know? Yeah, I got to, I got to take a look and see. Uh, because I don't know, it could be, I mean, listen, I, I ran these wires a while ago. So something may have happened, uh, you know, a rat might have ate it outside or a raccoon got into I don't know. So we'll, we'll right. see what it is. Uh, guys, go to our website, gfknetwork.com. Subscribe to the podcast. We're everywhere podcasts are available. 
if you're watching us live, stay tuned on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to talk to Paul. We're going to do our bonus show. If you enjoy the bonus show, go to patreon.com slash what the tech and fund us there. One dollar. That's all we're asking. Easy breezy. Simple. Uh, also, go to therot.com. Check out the Therot Premium. Uh, Paul has a great article about computers I have known a love story, which I thought this was really nice. I like this article on Therot Premium. This was one of my favorite ones uh, of the year so far, actually. You go into your love affair with your Commodore 64. You actually, this is pretty cool. Any any uh, pictures? Yeah. I'm assuming th these pictures are from the, from the scanning that you did, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, these yeah, are great. In fact, I, I've been waiting. I've been kind of sitting on this because as I've been scanning, I get more and more of these things. And this morning, I was like, I got, I got to put this up. But I know when I put this up, like uh, there'll be more, you know. Um, but yeah, this is what I found so far. By the way, the the second one, the second picture that mm -hmm. you have, I believe it's the Commodore sixty four C. That's right. Um, that I had that same exact computer desk that I believe oh, yeah. my parents. Yeah. Sure I, like I believe. I'm going to guess it's a Sullivan. <laughs> Probably. Yep. It's a Sullivan computer yep. desk. And my parents bought this from computer city. I'll never forget that. Yeah. I was going to guess Sears, but I, it could be from it. I don't remember exactly. It could be I Sears bought also. That. Around 1989, 1988, this desk. Yeah. That picture was probably taken in 1987, but I bought that desk that year because I moved cross country, but I brought the computer. I had a, I think in that picture you can see it's an Epix joystick. Epix was like a game making company and they made a high yeah. performance joystick that was really nice. It's red. And then I don't you can't see it in that picture, I don't think, but on the corner piece, because remember there was like a triangular piece that went out to where the printer stand was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I had an Okamate twenty um it's like a thermal printer. So it would actually heat like wax basically to make color it would kind of print in these you could see the stripes you know, from the, the printhead or whatever. I had quite a, I had a, quite a little setup. Yeah, this is wild. I, I think the second one also, I believe that's a Sullivan. The second desk is definitely a Sullivan desk. I eventually uh, got a the really Apple 2G. sweet. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I eventually got a really nice desk, um, set of desks actually, uh, at like kind of a, it wasn't den market, but it was like a Copenhagen imports kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever ikea type thing but not but not really high quality yeah this is cool i, I enjoyed this article so guys if you are a throw premium member go check it out because it's actually really uh, nice to go down memory lane and kind of see the things that you personally use also if you're not a throw premium member consider joining uh throw premium as well you can follow me on twitter at andrew zarin you can follow paul at the rot and that's it for this week we'll see you all later I do a weird sign off now. I do this. We'll see you all later. I don't know why I do, I do this every week. I do this every week. I do the Pope uh, wave on the way out the door. Like this? How does the Pope wave go? No, this yes. is a, this is the Pope wave. All right. I'm going to hit record and we're going to start. We're good to go. We're good to start. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fun. This is only for me, guys. <laughs> okay. Hey everybody, welcome to What The Talk. This is our bonus show. We record this live each and every week exclusively on patreon.com slash what the tech. I'm Andrew Zarin. I'm joined. I'm finally joined by Paul Thorod. Oh, so good to have you here, Paul. I believe uh, you were the problem last week, no? Uh, I was the problem last week and, and, and the problem probably the week before. I've been, uh, I've been a messy boy. My life has been a disaster <laughs> the last week, but sure. it's fine. Um, Hey, by the way, I'm looking at a photo of your desk mm -hmm. from 2003. Those are some okay. sweet Klipsch speakers. Klipsch, yeah. I, I I often had Bose speakers. Like I had um I had those I had those Howard speakers. Bose speakers from my Apple II GS that were white, that color match, right? And you could actually you could mount them vertically or horizontally on the speaker stands, and they I had brackets to put them onto the desk, and the Bose logo would <laughs> you could rotate it so it looked right. Um, and then later in life, after the clip speakers, I did go back to Bose for a while as well. And here's a question for you: Do you have speakers on your desk right now? Do you have speakers? No, uh, no, but that's actually a very recent development. So mm -hmm. I, I'm using the built-in speakers in this all-in-one computer for the computer. Um, the Xbox One that I use, I, I have these powered studio monitors. They're awesome speakers. But remember, I dropped that display on the ground <laughs> and broke it. Yeah, the display I brought in 
has a built built in stereo speakers, which sounds like how good could they be? But the truth is, I actually hear things in the games that I never heard before with those Through supposedly the... superior stereo yeah. separated speakers. So I'm just using the built. Uh, it's interesting. It's so those speakers are just on the ground. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them, but uh, yeah, I usually do. So since we are doing a bonus show together today, um, mm -hmm. I do want to. I do want to talk to you. I, I generally do this once a year where I interview you. And yeah. um, I, I, I always find it bizarre. I'm running out of things. No, no, no. I, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Uh, I, I think it's bizarre to interview a friend because I've we've been friends for <laughs> almost, true. I think, like eight years now. And hmm. uh, we kind of do a show where we're talking to each other. Uh, and we're talking <laughs> to of, yeah. at each other. You know, it, but it's yep. not like me asking you questions. And you answering them. It, it's more of a, if I'm asking a question, it's a general question that we're going to go into. But uh, I really enjoy interviewing you. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and also Mary Jo Foley is probably, well, actually Mary Jo is my best interview I've ever done. It's Mary Jo Foley and Jake the Snake Roberts. My two favorite <laughs> interviews that I've ever I done in my life. Anyone named Jake is just automatically the snake. Jake the Snake Roberts. Yeah, the professional Everyone wrestler. Everyone named Jake, Jake is Jake the Snake, whatever his last name is. How could you not be? How could you not be Jake the Snake? Um, uh, Jake Plummer, former quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals. Jake the Snake. <laughs> Jake the Snake. Um, so I, I, but you're up there as far as my favorite people to talk to and interview because there's, you know, your your path to journalism and your path to <laughs> what you do yeah. today is sure. really. It was a couple things that happened in your life that kind of brought you in the scenario, and and I kind of like my life is like that too. You know, I was never supposed to do this as my living. I was never supposed to get into radio. I loved radio, and you, you did also. I mean, we, we spoke about how you would record, you know, fake radio shows essentially when you were younger. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and I would do the same thing. So we we kind of have that similar thing, and that brought us into this podcasting thing because this is essentially radio now. This is yeah, we have is, more yeah, of a reach. I, I got. <clears throat> I was talking to um, a network here in New York. <laughs> Yeah. I guess I could say it. I don't care. I, I was talking to WABC, and WABC was mm -hmm. very interested in syndicating the show and uh, and Matt Men, and the mm -hmm. potential reach that we would have in New York City, right? New York City, right. the biggest market on the planet for radio. New York, it's it's the, where people want to go. We would have a smaller reach, <laughs> sure, compared to what we get regularly on a podcast basis where people have to go and download and find us. It, it's it's actually amazing how this is blown up and podcasting has become the uh, the way that we well, we just talked about TV about and how different it is. I mean, it's the same thing, right? It, yeah. This is the digital transformation of this business, you know? You know, and when I started about 10 years ago, it's, it's going to be 10 years next two months for GFQ. Um, yep. There wasn't as much noise, right? Like, I, it was easy for me now, I, listen I, I'm, I'm not i'm not saying that this was easy but as far as a grand scheme goes for for a 25 year old with no broadcasting experience with no engineering experience with with audio or video to put something together and say ah that's good enough and for people to find <laughs> you and discover you it was very easy compared yeah, to yeah. you know like we were on stickham at one point i, I don't you remember that paul we, we used to yeah, broadcast or, on yeah. stickham and leo did also when Leo left, that was kind of the best thing that ever happened to me because they needed to fill that right. space up for, for tech. That's funny. And we were yep. getting like 50,000 unique viewers an hour. It was wild. And that's how this kind of parlayed into this. But there was less noise. And I'm right. sure for you, you know, with the rot, the rot com and your previous, you know, ventures that you've done and the previous companies that you worked with, you, yep. the noise level wasn't there as much. Obviously, everybody knew their key websites that they went to. You knew CNET, yeah. you knew ZDNet. But a specialty site that was kind of hand curated content and written by w one person like you was yep. kind of easier to kind of go through that noise. Now we are in a terrible uh, content overload where it's not as easy to break through the noise. And I kind of wanted to talk to you about that as far as like the rot.com mm -hmm. goes and all the content that you do. Um, yep. You, you know, you're kind of a specialty because you do you write <laughs> you do video yeah. and you do audio and all three of the things that you do are, are pretty successful you know as far as the grand scheme of things go but do you think yeah. it's harder now to break through compared to 10 years ago like if you started a podcast tomorrow do you think it's oh. more difficult now uh to kind of break through the noise and to gain uh the exposure mm. 
compared to 10 years ago when, you know, Twitter wasn't as uh, right. popular and Facebook, no, it wasn't as big. It wasn't as uh, the source for yeah. news or source for content. Uh, yeah, I, I have to guess because I, I'm not starting now, <laughs> but uh, it's certainly hard enough for me uh, being established. I mean, it's there's a, like you said, there's a lot of choices now. I, I think there's a a very app store like thing that's happening with podcasts right now where they've crested some wave and it's mainstream and everyone knows about it and it's super popular and everyone's checking out podcasts and the quality has gone up dramatically. There are incredible podcast series of every kind imaginable. We can go down that rabbit hole and talk about some favorites or whatever. And I, um, but whatever uh, it, it's from a consumer standpoint, it's hard because there's so many choices. And from a content creator's perspective, it's hard because you get lost in that sea of choices, you know? And so you just said, and you're right, you know, I, what I do is essentially some kind of a specialty thing. You know, I'm not, I mean, I just talked about the Patriots, for example, on the thing. Nobody cares about my opinion of the Patriots. It's just a personal thing. But um, people who do listen to me probably listen to me for whatever, you know, personal technology, Windows, whatever. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's it's getting harder and harder. It's like domain names. You know, there aren't any good ones left. If you want to make a name for yourself today, you have to pick something, a topic that's not already saturated by bigger, better, more experienced voices, you know? Yeah. And uh, you, your options are limited. Um, I'll just mention this in passing because I think you and I had, uh, I think I talked to you about this, but my wife is starting a home swap. Like, I guess you would call it a house swap blog we argue over that term but whatever and because we do a home swap every year we've done it every year since 2006 almost always in europe uh usually for three weeks in length um i try to spend a month of the year every year overseas i think i've been doing that since at least since 2011 something like that but whatever and so there's a there's a thing that like her and i uh, and she does most of that work with the home swap I mean, that's mostly her um have a certain experience level that most people don't have. And it's a topic that's of interest. It's a specialty topic for sure. But most people who own homes especially will hear that and say, oh, like home swapping, that's actually really interesting. I could never let people into my house like that. Or, oh my God, how do I get started? You know, those, those yeah. are the, pretty much the two reactions. But even for the people who are not, in, like who never believe they're going to want to do this, there, there might be some interesting information there regardless. Because uh, they're still kind of fascinated by the topic, uh, by that topic. So, will my wife's home swap blog be the next super site for Windows or the you know whatever? No, probably not. Uh, and um, there's a built-in audience size uh, potential for anything. Um, I don't know what it is. You know, we'll, well, I guess we're going to find out. But um, you know, could we turn that into podcasts and? other stuff uh you know yeah, maybe <laughs> you know yeah. I don't, we don't have a lot of you know no but listen uh, but but here's the great thing about this right the fact that mm -hmm. your wife can do a website on oh, yeah. home swapping and yeah. the fact that she can do a podcast on home swapping you know we were talking about how we're, to, we're doing sure, the yeah. show today yeah if you wanted to and, and you know what mm -hmm. the the technical uh disadvantages and the technical difficulty is nowhere yeah. near it was 10 years ago. So when we talk about cutting that's through true. the noise, obviously that's some noise, right? Any kind of uh, barrier is noise, in my opinion. You don't you don't have those. Like right now, Paul, it's wild. You're in uh -huh. Pennsylvania. I'm in New York. I can't, yeah. my, I have a broken uh, system here. So the way that I'm doing this, I'm vmixing in, which is WebRTC. I'm video calling into my computer that's here. So are you. And yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. it works. It's And, and by the way, my audio... I'm using a three hundred dollar microphone or five whatever this is five hundred dollar microphone I can't remember, and I'm plugging it into and this is wild, a five dollar Radio Shack USB to XLR adapter. This thing is phenomenal. I got it on clearance when Radio Shack was shutting down. The same one is being sold on Amazon through another company for seventy dollars. Same same yeah. piece, just rebranded. Right. So uh, that's how I'm connecting my audio. So. Obviously, a lot of this is easy, but one thing that is changing is the YouTube generation. You know, we're doing old man yeah. content. You know, yeah. I'm 35. I, I'm a I'm a dinosaur to a lot of these kids. A 20 year old. You are. I, think I, feel. I know. It, it, I have it's a hard scary. time with the YouTube stuff, by the way, because you know, obviously, in my own little, uh, I, I, you know, if you think about like uh, you ever watch a movie, 
And if you know a little too much about whatever the thing is, you can tell when it's fake and when it's real and kind of takes you out of the movie a little bit. Like I used to work in banking. So I watched these bank robbery movies and it's like, yeah, no, that could never happen. That's not how that works. Um, I have a hard time with the YouTube stuff because uh, in my own little world, uh, you know, of windows and PCs and consumer electronics, whatever, I've been doing this for 20, almost 25 years, not quite 25 years, I guess, but almost 25 years. And, um, you look at these kids with their opinions and they're trying to tell you which phone is best and Apple's crazy for doing this and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I can't, I almost can't take it. Like it's so, most of it is so terrible. And these guys that are like giant YouTube stars, like I, I just don't, I just diff- think they're vapid and pointless, you know? It's a very different most way to deliver a message, right? And I, I'm not saying, listen, yeah. I think some of that stuff is really good. We were on YouTube. We are not gen- well, we're not specifically is, YouTube content. Some of it is good. I, yeah, for, of course. Listen, some I like, it, I like my friend, John Prosser. I, I think, mm-hmm. I, I think he's a, he's a shithead. But I, I like his content uh, a lot. I think John um, does John does a very good job at delivering that kind of content because he understands long form content as yeah. well. So in that world that he's in, I, I think it's reached a saturation point, um, just as it has, I think, for podcasts, just as it probably has for like those Netflix type shows. Like we're, we're reaching a, you know, you used to be able to go to Netflix if it was like a Netflix original show, you, you'd know it was going to be great. You could just watch all of them are great. But now there are like 12,000 of them. And actually some of them aren't great. You know, a lot of them are things that really aren't Netflix originals. They're things that were made for like some international uh, TV station or whatever. And, and they're, you know, Netflix bought them for us distribution and it's just not necessarily great. And, and so it's hard. I mean, um, you know, if you wanted to start today and I'm going to be like the next big YouTube star, and I'm going to make movies or videos about windows or something like, I, I think that ship's pretty much already sailed. Yeah. I don't think there's a lot, <laughs> there's I, a lot I of think, room for that voice anymore. You know, you know, the other thing that is great. So I, I don't, I never want to discourage someone from trying to create content. Right. And, and no, I but do you want to find say, something that's unique, right? You have to be unique and what you're doing has to be unique. Right. Yeah. That's I think the central point. So the way that the way that success is measured is obviously by views and downloads and all that stuff. But another way that success is measured by how much money you could kind of make doing something. We are yeah. we are matured content at this point and we've been doing it for a mm-hmm. while. So we have a reputation with advertisers or we have a reputation with our audience that they know we're going to be consistent with doing this. So if we're getting a hundred and I'm throwing the number, which is probably close, 180,000 downloads a, week, a month. Right. Generally, mm-hmm. if, if that's our download view listenership, it's consistent on yeah. YouTube. However, that number, 100,000, 50,000 is 25,000. Good. I don't know because it's measured very <laughs> differently. 25,000 yeah, is measured very differently compared to 25,000 for a podcast. So sure. that, that's a, that's a problem. The other thing is I see content that is produced very well. Uh, it, it's consistent. The mm-hmm. host knows what he's talking about. It's in, in that YouTube format and it has like 15,000 yep. de- views or whatever it is and has yeah. a dedicated audience. But at the end of the day, it doesn't translate to much, which is interesting to me. I think we're in this weird uh, over again because of noise, because you have 500 other videos next to you that are being suggested. That's the same exact content that you're doing. Right. So I, I don't know, but. Do you think like with what you do, Paul, like with the website, what how do, do you do? stay? <laughs> do you no, no. With what you're doing, right? On therot.com. Oh, how do yeah, you yeah. stay? First of all, it has to be difficult not to fall into that clickbaity nonsense, right? Because that's essentially uh, no, not, not for you. I'm saying I'm saying for, I'm not for you, but I'm saying for yeah. um, for a blog, for a website. Uh, when you, you know, look at, I, I, you, well, look at you know, every country. once in a while, I'll write a provocative headline, right? And people will say, oh, that's a clickbait, you know? Um, no, it's not a clickbait is when you, uh, when the promise of the headline is not met by the article, that's clickbait. The point the, think about what the word means. <laughs> I, I have d- promised you something and then I didn't deliver it. That's clickbait. I'm a writer. I want people to read what I write. If I write a good headline or a provocative headline, that's not clickbait. That's just good writing. Um, you know, if you think about a, a site that has bad writing like Forbes, where it's like Apple just, you know, admitted to a serious problem and they, they reuse the same exact headline type all the time for everything. That's clickbait. That's because there's, there's no there there. It's just fake. And so, um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, it is a business. And so 
there's a team of people around me and uh, not under me, by the way, or yeah. uh, around me. It's a team, you know, it's not just me. I mean, my name happens to be on that, that site, but it's, there are other sites and it's a bigger business and it's not just me, but, um, and, and there are people who understand marketing and people who understand social media and, and, you know, and we go back and forth and I, my whole thing over my whole life, uh, adult life doing this stuff has been more seat of the pants and more, um, intuition than it has been yeah. calculated anything. Right. And, um, you know, you talked about, you said earlier, you know, I'm kind of established in writing and then you said audio and video. And the truth is I never, I just show up for this stuff, right? Whether it's here or windows weekly or first ring daily, I don't have the wherewithal to get that stuff going. I would have missed the podcasting thing if it had just been up to me, you know, Leo called me and Leo has the infrastructure, you know, that made windows weekly and whatever other shows you do uh, happen. And it's great, but it's, I would have missed that myself. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not positioning myself as some kind of genius. Like I, and as far as the stuff that I, I decide to cover and what I write about and everything, I mean, you know, back when I first got started, I probably told you, probably heard this story before, but I think it's kind of relevant. I mean, the industry was very different then. There were actually paper-based magazines that went out every week. Yeah. Info, Info World and uh, PC Week, uh, which became eWeek over time. And they were like these big kind of raggy newspaper -y kind of looking things. And uh, that's how I would read that news, you know. And back before then, there would just be magazines. Like, you know, back in the Commodore days, I'd read these Commodore magazines. I remember thinking the Commodore magazines were always like out of date because they were like a two-month lead time on the publishing. But the weeklies were always like from that week, you know. And, and that I was how read... you got your information, yeah. Yeah, so I'd read those. And I would say, well, 90% of this is irrelevant, right? But there's some percentage in here that's really interesting. And I need but the people that I work with to know about this stuff. And so I'd send out a newsletter saying, here's what they wrote and here's why I think this is important. And that kind of became the, the basis of what became WinInfo and the daily newsletter that I wrote for many, many years. And um, I, I think that, uh, I don't want to call it perspective, but that style, that way of doing things has continued to this day. Um, I, I guess I could cover every single stupid little thing that happens, whether it's just Microsoft or if I want to expand it out to and the then whole. you just, and then that brings the the clicks and whatever. Yeah, maybe, but you know what? Maybe uh, not everything is important and um, life is too short. <laughs> and I don't think that that's, I personally, that's not the way I want it to be. And so well, another aspect, I'll give you, I'll give you an example, how this is changing, right? Right now we're doing mm -hmm. the show. We have about 70 people on YouTube watching this, which is actually mm -hmm. not a, it's not our high number generally like, yeah, because we we got less consistent and now we're building it again it's getting there but we were doing like 200 people an episode mm -hmm. watching live which is phenomenal um alex knight one of the guys in youtube right now in the chat just donated five mm -hmm. bucks just right there boom hit the dollar button and just gave us five bucks that is wow. a uh an amazing by the way thank you alex but that is amazing to <laughs> right. think of that concept right that that yeah at any moment anybody's watching um, and they can say you know what i like this conversation here you go Here's a couple bucks. Yeah, that could be transformative. Um, I, I just coincidentally, I wrote a um, an article, I think it was yesterday, called Confluence. And it was kind of about this. It, it's kind of related. It is related to this because the traditional publishing method is you have some kind of an expert who writes a book back in the day, or maybe he starts a website back in the day, or maybe today he would start a podcast. And he would tell you everything you needed to know about whatever the topic was, financial freedom or traveling to Europe or how technology works or whatever nonsense it is that you care about the most. And it was a one-way conversation. You know, he was the expert. He told you what you needed to know. You sucked it up. Yeah. And I always wanted it to be more of a conversation. I think one of the things I like about the podcasts and one of the things I always wanted for the websites, and, and you have to some degree with comments and so forth, is that it's a two-way street, right? And I never, um, never presented myself as the expert, right? I have uh, some number of years of experience for sure. I mean, if you, you know, there are there are a few people in the Microsoft world who have as much experience with this company as I do. There are actually a few, of course, and people like Mary Jo have even more experience than I do. But this is a very select number of people. A lot of the people who write about Microsoft in my space are way less experienced than I am. It doesn't mean they're not experts, <laughs> but I, I, but I don't. I don't really position myself as an expert. Um, this 
past, you mentioned one of these things, but this past month has been very interesting because there have been two uh, kind of high profile examples of readers giving me advice that I've taken on and I've changed the way that I do things as a result. Yeah. And I love that. Right. And so yeah. the high speed pr- photo scanner, uh, which is, um, you know, how I'm getting all these photos scanned, the ones that you And by the way, it looks about. amazing. That photo, that, that photo looks yeah. great. Well, they look, uh, it's as good as it can look given the source material, right? So it's fine. It's great. Um, I, but the point is I'm getting it done. Like this is, a. Uh, something I never would have completed on my own. And now I'm going to be able to complete it. And it's thanks to this guy who recommended it. And so that's really neat. And then, you know, less exciting, but in the email application, I've been st- sort of struggling with email recently and uh, I never heard of this app and he recommended it. It's fantastic. And I'm going to buy it. I'm using it. And so it's neat. And so that, that two way interaction I think is key. And I think it's a big difference today in publishing. And, and so if you kind of get past the, uh, you know, these specific differences, like we're publishing on YouTube versus we used to use some ancient web technology to get a website onto the internet, or we used to print the paper and it was, I hope you got it right. Cause you can never fix it. Honestly, yeah. the big differences is uh, interactivity, right? And so if you're on YouTube, you're interacting with somebody, which you can do. A lot of these guys who stream games can interact with their viewers, which they do. Um, it, I think it's the interactive nature. Yeah. That's this. changing that everything. No, more, that is changing. More, so I can converse with you. It's a conversation. But when we can converse with others, it's a it's a better conversation. And I think so, that's fascinating in a way. I'll give you an example here. Um, so what the tech, obviously, it's it's what the tech and Matt Men are my two top shows. And two things that I absolutely love is technology and, and pro wrestling. I, I I mean it's it's a bizarre world I'm in that I'm I, I'm 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 an executive producer of a professional wrestling <laughs> television show here in New York. Sure. We just got syndication in the UK on the Fight Network. We're going to be in Zimbabwe. We're going to be in Canada. So it, it's like a yeah. career that was a hobby that took off, much like everything else that I've done. So, okay. but that audience, um, and a little bit, a little bit of this is my own, you know, nurturing of that audience because I had to work a little bit harder to gain the audience because I didn't have a core like you. You know, when we started doing the show, obviously I had that boost early on and then I was working with you and you, I mean, really, uh, I attribute a lot of my career to you. You know, you brought legitimacy to me and uh, with with technology. <laughs> I've learned a lot from you with technology. Uh, so I, I attribute a lot of the, the tech stuff that I do to you, but I've had mm-hmm. to do less uh, nurturing with the audience. Right. And I kind of fell into yeah. this where five years ago you really didn't have to. But now you have to be. Uh, you have to communicate and you have to talk to them and you have to know who your yeah. audience is and be very connected to them. And this is something that I've done very well with the wrestling stuff because I had to really work at it. To, and, and it was an easy conversation. You know, it requires very little thought. With technology, mm-hmm. it's a little bit more of a, a, a uh, not thoughtless, but a thoughtful conversation where you got to think about what you're going to say and how you're going to present it because it could be misconstrued into something else. Um, I've started yes. doing more... You know, right now with this chat room, I love looking at the chat and talking to them and doing the show. And I think that is what content like this, uh, this is what's going to separate and break through the noise. You know, we're talking about the noise. Yeah. The fact that you can go and say thanks to Alex for donating and and talk to, you know, people in the chat and Albert's in there. And I see Albert in there every week and Greg's in there and all these guys. It's easy to um, take a second and talk. And I think that's what makes content different. You know, the difference between what I'm doing right. and the difference between, you know, a radio show, for example. Uh, a radio show is not going to sit there and thank uh, an individual <laughs> person that just gave them five well, bucks live on the air. It, sure. it's, it's a rarity. It's a very small – because there's a wall of, between you and the audience. I, yeah, You know, yeah, yeah. this kind of content breaks well, through I think that. That, that. That's all going away. I mean, th- this thing that we're doing in, in what we'll call the radio space um, – is the new normal, you know? And I think it's great. It I, I think it's a it's an improvement. Hey, listen, if, if this doesn't work out, I'll just become a cam girl. That's it. I'll just become a cam model. <laughs> sure. I'll just I'm I'm used to getting tips anyway. I'll just start taking shirts off. Mm-hmm. You know, that, just that'll wear a happen. garter. Just wear a garter. <laughs> I, I do think it's amazing. But do you what do you have planned? Like the next couple of years, right? You you're seeing the evolution yeah. of content, and obviously you're, you're and you brought it up. You got to kind of shuck and jive and kind of go with the flow and evolve. If you don't evolve, especially nowadays, <laughs> listen, sure. I'm an old man and I'm 35 years old to a lot of the viewership, to a lot of the generation, like especially with the wrestling stuff. 
the wrestling yeah. stuff, I'm, and I say this in the best way, not the worst way. I am you with the wrestling stuff because I yeah. have the experience and I have the age and I'm able to articulate mm -hmm. my thought in a way that I'm doing better than a 20 year old that's just screaming and reacting emotionally. Um, mm -hmm. How do you, like, what is, what do you see happening? How do you plan on evolving a little bit more, like with The Rock, for example? Because, <laughs> I mean, it really, yeah. the website, I is, don't know. I mean, I, it's one of my favorite I, sites. Part to of it, yeah. I mean, part of it is just playing to your strengths. You know, one of the, um, it's not an argument. You know, one of the debates we kind of have uh, at work is, you know, you, you can kind of see how the world's going. It's like, well, we need to do this. And we need to do this. We need to do this. And, you know, when I hear those kinds of things, it's like, well, you're, you're telling me I need to do this. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're not going to collectively do this. I'm going to have to do this. I already do a lot of stuff. And, you know, this is just more stuff for me to do. And so, you know, when I, when I look at um, like this year, for example, um, you know, a lot of it is just staying the course. You kind of, you, you know, you do what you're doing, but one thing I'd like to get back into, which isn't so much like a new thing, it's more of an old thing, but um, I want to do more interviews, for example. I think there are a lot, especially at a company like Microsoft, where I have kind of a rich history. You know, a lot of people have been there for a long, long time. Um, and talk about things, um, you know, from the past maybe, or, you know, kind of look at perspective, how the company's changed over years, whatever. So I tend to do a lot more interviews um, and make that more of a formal thing. And so that's one of the big things. Um, I wanted to change this year. I mean, we're going to do a lot more. Um, we do a lot of uh, uh, traveling where we go to like, you know, industry events. We have a bunch of those scheduled, both Microsoft and non-Microsoft. Uh, Brad and I do a lot of video at those events and like those are usually kind of fun. Um, and I mean, I can't, I, some of it I can't, you know, I can't, some of it I can't really kind of get into, but it's, you want to, you know, respect the the core of what it is that you do. I, I'm a, I see myself as a writer, um, primarily, almost exclusively. But you know, you kind of want to branch into this other stuff. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion around. Like, I publish a review to the site. Should there be a video review of the of the same product as well, right? Which you could put on YouTube, et cetera. Yeah, there should be. Yeah. Who's going to make that? <laughs> Am I going to yeah. make that? You want me to write the review? And then I have to record a video and then edit a video and produce the video. <laughs> like you, what is it you think I am? I mean, I don't, you know, uh, it's, it's a, it's a tough, you know, it's a tough thing. Um, it is tough. Obviously. It is tough, especially, you know, obviously you have a great team behind you. You got Brad and, and, and yeah, yeah. Well, people that know what he knows that, you know, uh, as well, we're going to do more live event stuff this year uh, too. So I, I, I don't think it's, problematic Listen, to say you, that I, in you need someone uh, to do late, it you got me to do it yes yeah, so we might but in late um i almost said february actually i guess it's late march we're gonna do a thing in, in new york mary joe and brad and i um that i think will be of interest to a lot of people and i think we're going to try to do those on a more regular basis and it's video related live event related um so i can't say too much so i mean we, we have obviously yeah various plans but yeah listen i think that's the amazing thing right the fact that you could say like i want to go live and then you just got to put the pieces together after that because it's possible 10 years ago to go live from rattle and hum or whatever bar you know you would yeah. possibly do it at or Microsoft. like we did the microsoft store right we we yeah. we produced yep. i produced it yep. locally i sent it to twit and twit put it on the air um that was not really an easy task 10 years ago that would have sure. required oh, yeah. a lot more effort Compared to, right. you know, how we did it. And by the way, we did it three years ago, two years ago. The amount of effort it would take today mm -hmm. is half of what it was then. Right. Right. Uh, it, for it's sure. just the evolution of content creation, the evolution of getting information out there. Um, they, you know, I was 22 months. I was busy. I, I, I had a full time job and I went through a life changing process of having two amazing kids and remodeling my house and, and you know, having a real job for the first time in my life uh right i i i feel like those 22 months i missed out on a lot of this but uh sure. i wouldn't have the perspective i have now uh if i hadn't done it you know my boss at, at that job was is one of the most brilliant people i've ever worked with so hmm. i learned a lot and i'm able to incorporate that into now and i have a little bit more discipline with stuff but the reality is you know everything is changing especially you know even the way you write paul and i've always said to you you, you do something that a lot of people don't. And this is mm -hmm. 
a key thing. You know, when you look at Google, the most successful websites are written at a fifth or sixth grade level. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, seriously. But your writing yeah. is not pompous. It's not arrogant. It comes off that I'm reading it and I hear the voice that you're saying it in and I could relate to it. And I think that plays a big part into a successful article. You know, you're writing a you're reviewing, let's say, a Lenovo laptop. How many other websites are reviewing that Lenovo? A ton of them. Sure. But why does yours sure. stand out? Because it's written in a voice that can be relatable. And you're not so on the take. Just, you know, that's also yeah, part no, of it. I'm, not, I'm definitely not on the take. Um, I wish I was on the take. That'd be nice. Um, no, I, I, that's not, you know, calculated. It's just kind of the way I am. Um, I, I, in the sense that there are probably no stories I have that have been told a million times. I mean, when I first signed up at when, well, what became Windows IT Pro it was still NT Mag magazine back in the day. Um, I was writing a weekly editorial for them and I, <laughs> I, I the first in-person meeting I had out in Colorado with this team was basically it was like the scene in airplane where everyone's waiting in line to beat up on the person who's you know histrionic in the seat and it was the entire editorial team around a table all of them taking swings at the way that I wrote and it was so against their style guide you have to stop saying I and me it's too personal your yeah. sentences are too long you need to blah, 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 like on and on and on and went and I was like guys um I'll do this for your stuff because I get it. It's a magazine and it's formal and, you know, whatever. But I am not changing the way that I write for this place. I'm like, I'm sorry. This works for me. Like, this is me. And what what's interesting about that, and this, again, it's not, I, I, I want to be really clear. It's not, I'm a genius and I saw the future. But that kind of became <laughs> the way things are, right? Like, a lot of stuff is now, like, personal stories and, you know, it, it not straight up news, like it's people right. injecting their opinions into stuff. And, you know, one of the things I said like early on is I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna call or write a, an expert and get a quote. You know, I, I'm gonna supply that opinion. I'll do that myself. You know, like you see that in articles all the time. You know, Bob yeah. Smith, analyst at IDC, thinks that the PC market is gonna tank. You know, I don't care what Bob Smith thinks. I think the <laughs> PC market's gonna tank. I'm gonna write about that. You know, like, yeah. I, I that was just my shtick. I don't know what to call it. It wasn't a calculated. This is how I'm going to be successful. I, I just figured it out. I don't mean it like that. It's just I'm just going to be me. You know. But you also, I mean, this is the other thing, right? Uh, for all the love that you get, you also have detractors. Uh, same with me. And I think it has well, to yeah, do with sure. the fact that you are you, you when you say, I, like for me, a lot of my detractors come from the fact that I speak for the general audience. When I'm talking, when I'm asking <laughs> questions, and when I'm yeah. when I'm thinking about computer usage or PC usage, I'm not thinking about me. I'm thinking about everybody else, right? And right. and that's how you measure success. Success is not measured by the small micro group of people that are very much into a product. Success is measured by mainstream yeah. exposure and everybody using it. So when I talk, I, I talk about that, even though I have a pretty technical background, uh, and I get shit for that. You also, I, uh, you get I, crap I'm, for saying that you're wrong, and you are you are very uh, quick to say when you're wrong, you're wrong, and yeah, people just, people think that that's I mean, people think that's I'm a not, problem. I'm, right? I'm not Nostradamus, Andrew. You know, like I just <laughs> like you know whatever. I, look, I, I, I'll give you an example. You're not like, a this cheerleader. Actually, but you're not a cheerleader. No, no, I'm absolutely not a cheerleader. I mean, um, last summer Microsoft was rumored to be releasing a $400 version of Surface Pro, and then it became known that this thing was Surface Go. I got to see it early in New York, and you know, look good. It's like high quality. Uh, you know, the build quality is very high and everything looks like a service product. Great. I said, we'll have to see what it's like in real life though, right? Yeah. Before we have an opinion on this thing. And so uh, when you see what it's like in real life, the, the performance is terrible. It's off the charts terrible. It's not even close. Battery life is like four to five hours, which is completely unacceptable in 19, uh, 2018 at the time. And then for me personally, as an adult, uh, it's not a full-size keyboard, so I can't really type on it. It's uncomfortable. Even Mary Jo says she can't type on it. Yeah. Um, and so to me, that's like a triple whammy of, um, I can't recommend this product. I can't, I'm not even going to bother with it. It's just, it's a non-event. It doesn't matter if it's affordable compared to other Surface devices. It's just not a device I can recommend. But, you know, there's a, there's a huge part of this country, and I'll say the world probably as well, that can't handle that kind of directness. And they want what they want is some kind of a a wiggle room, like a little bit of an out. Like, 
Because, yeah. you know, some of them bought it. And they're like, well, you know, I bought the thing and now I, you're making me look like a jerk. You know, I obviously don't make good decisions because your opinion says that this thing is a piece of crap. Could you at least admit that it would make sense as a blah, 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 whatever? And it's like, no, this makes sense under no circumstances. You know, Mary <laughs> yeah. Jo will say that. Well, she's like, well, I like it sometimes because I'm going out and I can stick it in my bag. It's really small. And if something comes up, I, I have it with me. And it's like, well, that's a that's a very nice thing for you rich people to have. You have computers for special purposes. Like you have different pairs of shoes. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> it must be nice to be that rich. You know, like, I don't mean to make fun of Mary Jo, but I mean, sure, sure, I, sure. I'm not looking, she, what she's doing really is making people who did buy the thing feel like they aren't idiots. And I don't, I'm not trying to say they're idiots. If you like it, it's fine. I don't care. But I can't recommend it to other people. I can't. It's you personally, you personally cannot recommend it. Maybe cannot, they can recommend it. You cannot recommend it. I, I, gotta, I always so, have that argument with people. Like, I, not everything that works well for me is going to work well for you. I could only speak on my personal experience. Well, no, I no, use I, Mac. I, I, I no, use no. Mac for my personal experience. I basically, no, no, you know. I, I'm, but hold on. I'm not saying it's not good for me. It's not good for me. I'm saying it's not good for you. <laughs> I'm saying well, it's not okay, good for anybody. Okay. No, my, my point here is it's not good for anybody. Nobody should buy this thing. It's terrible. Um, the problem is in the Windows community that, that is, you know, that I'm a part of is it's a Microsoft product and people don't like to hear that, you know, and it's like, what are you doing? You kind of wrote, you, you kind of wrote against the stream here. Like, and I have been asked twice. I do a weekly Q and a thing with the uh, premium readers where they can ask me questions in the past three months. I have been asked twice, <laughs> maybe by the same person. Um, are you surprised that this product that you think is a piece of crap? has been so successful. Hmm. And it's like you're 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 connecting two things that have nothing to do with each other. I had I had no opinion when this thing launched whether it would be successful or not. But a month before it launched, I wrote an editorial where I think the title was something along the lines of a $400 Surface Pro question mark. Hell yes. Meaning Microsoft needs to get out of the super premium price scale thing and make Surface more affordable. And if one way to do that is to have a lower cost Surface Pro, I am all for it. Now, yeah. the way they did it, I don't agree with, right? But as far as it being successful, what does that have to do with my opinion of it? Um, I had no opinion about whether it would be successful, what degree of success. I, I still don't actually think it's all that successful, but whatever. Um, I it still, it doesn't make it not a piece of crap. <laughs> Ford Still sold looking. millions and millions of Ford Escorts. It doesn't mean those cars were good. They're not, it's not better than the Porsche. The Porsche is a lot more expensive. There's a reason people buy these things. Yeah. It's all they can afford. Part you know, of that's something I, I want to talk about this week on the show, kind of you kind of touched on that lightly, is the fact that the PC market is dwindling. You know, it, there's a major slowdown in growth on the PC market. And uh, well, I want well, I'll go into detail next week on this. <laughs> Yeah. On, on this on this growth and and how it's kind of plateaued and it's really uh, and i wrote in the notes and i kind of want to elaborate and i'm just going to leave a teaser because this we could talk about this for 30 minutes and we don't have 30 minutes sure um the slowdown of pc of the p of pc growth has less to do with sales and more to do with life expectancy uh life expectancy growth for computers the yeah. ability to have a computer and have it last seven years is way more realistic now because of better hardware and because of better software, yep. uh, more efficient software, better battery life. The technology has grown along with the software side where we can hang on to a laptop for seven years when mm -hmm. 10 years ago, a seven-year-old computer was, uh, I mean, it was, it was a dinosaur. terrible. It was, yeah. it was a dinosaur. It was, right, it was so unusable. You, you, you are correct. Um, uh, however, uh, as far as sales go, which is market share, um, the PC industry has actually collapsed. It, the growth has not slowed. It has reversed. And so Reverse, PC yeah. sales have fallen for seven years in a row. Um, that means th that as of today, the PC market is approximately two thirds the size it was at its peak in 2011. However, you're still correct because the installed base, which is the usage share, the amount of people out in the world using PCs has not changed. It's There's the 1.5 yeah. billion uh, Windows PCs out in the world. And that proves that what you just said is correct. Um, people billion, are holding billion, on to the computers. Right. 1.5 billion. Yeah. Bill, billion. Okay. Um, I heard a million. I so, like, <laughs> no. So uh, you're right. And the reason is because they're holding on to the PCs longer. So PCs can last longer because, frankly, that hardware curve where it was all megahertz, megahertz, megahertz has 
dropped off the face of the earth. The difference in performance between a quad core eighth generation, whatever it is today, and computer from four years ago is non-existent for most tasks. You know, if you're Word, Excel, email, web browsing. Um, the quality of the machines has gone up. People uh, are moving to mobile for a lot of the tasks that they used to do exclusively on PCs. That helps the PC last longer as well because they're only using it for certain things now. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's a fact. What you said is true. You know, somebody sent me an email and he said, what do you think is going to help reverse that? Like, what do you think it'll be? And and honestly, and this is obviously I'm going at a. <laughs> it's going to help reverse it. I, I do think something will reverse it. I do. It has to be. No, a, nothing will. Nothing a major, will. a major leap forward. Nope. I mean, no. you know, it's, it, it's to, no, <laughs> Andrew, it's never going to change. You know what this is? It's uh, we're, we're at a point now where it might do little ups and downs depending on some things down the road. There is never going to be a reversal where all of a sudden we need computers for more stuff. There isn't quantum computing, Paul. No, we're never going to need computers for more stuff. Yeah, um, we're, our time will be divided between other things. Voice, you know, it's the thing we we talk about this on the show all the time. You're going to be able to sit down in a plane, and the back of the thing is going to be a screen. It's going to iris log you in, and you have all your content. That tray is going to be a keyboard if you need to type. You don't need to bring a computer. You don't even need to bring a phone. Yeah. Um, the it's not something that disappears quickly, if at all. I mean, there'll always be some use for it. But this is like when the world went to uh, cars, you know, from like horses and buggies and things. And I'm sure there were people who are like, ah, this, this gas power. That car nonsense. thing is not yeah. happening. It's gas the horse wants to do this. The horse is coming back, baby. And you know what? <laughs> there are still horses. There are still horses. Nobody really rides them into town to get groceries now. But they still exist. You know, they're animals <laughs> or whatever. But... Yeah. Um, they don't, you know, horses don't go away, but they, they're no longer the center of transportation for families or whatever, for individuals. Yeah. And, and sure. the PC is like that, you know, and, and by the way, it, the PC is not uh, the only one, this is going to happen to phones. Oh You're yeah. It's already, it's already, it's already started already happening. Yep. Uh, and we talk about this, you know, it's, it's evolutionary now. It's not revolutionary. It's evolutionary. These devices are not yeah. progressing. Yeah, yeah. My iPhone seven plus is still great for me to use I, and and you would think i'm in technology i do this for a living i have one phone that i buy every year and i have another one i don't need to get a new iphone because this phone is is not just good enough but it's great and that wasn't a thing a while ago no no it's it, it it's a geez, my other computer is using narrator for some reason it's talking to me um I must have hit a button a couple of times too many or something. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I mean it's every uh, every generation of these computer dev computing devices, uh, it ha it comes to power more quickly and it goes away more quickly. That's what's been happening. I mean, we're moving right along. Um, yeah. I I don't know what to equate this to exactly, but we used to have to go into a room to use a computer. It it was a specific room because it would room sit in the there. House, yeah. Okay, and then we had lap, and then you could move around the house, and you could move around the world. You could take your computer around the world. Now you can put your computer in your pocket. It's eventually, your computer is going to be—it won't be something you have to carry and charge, and it's—it's—it will just be available. Uh, this this these resources will just be available yeah. to wherever you are. The the closest thing I can equate it to, I guess, is Star Trek. You know, where you're on the ship and something's going wrong, and you talk to some voice in the sky and what's going on in quadrant 12 and they tell you or the screen opens up and look at there's the klingon ship or whatever i'm gonna tell you i mean in, it's in 30 it's, years in 40 years they we're gonna they're gonna look back and say do you know how effing ridiculous these people were they were staring at this thing all day long they yeah. had they were they, they were constantly attached to it they were obsessed it was a mm -hmm. it was a it was a, a oh, an worse. They, they carried another charger they carried so the another thing would charger. be more portable, <laughs> right? Yeah, they're they, gonna, they like, are gonna that to them epidemic. will be stupider than smoking. Yeah, <laughs> they, they're they're never gonna understand. Uh, Doug, this is gonna be looked at as an epidemic, and how yeah. it, it shifted culture and it shifted yeah. uh, how we react with each other. When I was in Europe, when I was in in Ireland, Paul, and and then we wrap it up. You know what I did not see in Ireland? I did not see people at a bar with their phones out on the bar. I did not see yeah. it. Yeah. It, it it was non-existent. You know what? If you got a message, you looked at it quickly and you put it away. Nobody sure. had their phones out. I, and I, my friend you know, Chauncey that's been living there for about two years now goes, Andrew, look at the bar. Packed bar. Young. And it, it wasn't like an old man bar. It was like a young, like people cool People actually bar. talking to people. Yeah. He goes, 
we are the only assholes at the bar. Me, you, and your wife with our cell phones on the bar, <laughs> and we're looking at it constantly. Nobody else was well, doing that. I, this is not an American unique problem. I see this in Western Europe too. But but yeah, but fair enough. I I, I do think this weird thing with the phone is a temporary. I almost called it a temporary insanity, but it, what it really is is an sure immaturity. And I, I think it eventually goes away. I, in fact, if anything, the ability to find any fact that you need at any time is ultimately will be beneficial. It still is. It is today. But, you know, um, you're watching the Super Bowl and the, and I, I, what what's the game guy name of the guy or what's the thing? When was the last time that blah, Don't blah, blah, whatever it buck. is? I, don't, I, can say, I would never say those words out loud. Um, <laughs> uh, the ability to be able to do that doesn't detract from the conversation, right? Because there'll always be that person who's like, what are you doing? You, you know, there's people here. You should talk to the people. I am talking to people. We have a question. I, we, instead of speculating, we're going to get the answer, and then the conversation goes on. It, it's for the conversation, right? That. To me, that becomes a positive, not a negative. But but yeah, this, we've all been there. You walk in a restaurant or bar and four people Listen, sitting at the table. Somewhere. Not, they're interacting with someone else. Somewhere. You know? There's a time traveler. You know By the way, this is not unique to the, the smartphone thing. The, the other example of this, which granted could be on a phone, but is uh, you'll be talking to somebody in person like we are. Imagine my phone rang and uh, it's it not without even saying anything to you. I'll just pick it up and start talking to start somebody talking. else, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's this notion that the person you're with is the least important person to you. No matter what the problem is. the most is, horrible yeah. social mistake that I see again and again and again. Well, I tell you, know? emails, right? I, I do this all the time. I'm like, hold on, I got an email. Who? Yeah. The email could wait. The email yeah, you could got an wait. Email. That is it's the point like, of an email. I, right. It waits. I got a, I got a wire transfer. I got a, like a wire yeah. What do you call those things? A telegram. I'm going to tell know, you, Paul, the there day. is a time traveler somewhere and he came to 2018 and 2019 and then he went back and they go, so what did you learn? He's saying, he goes, you believe it? These assholes have every <laughs> answer yep. to every yep. question ever presented in their pocket. And you know what they're doing? They're fighting over That's... if a picture is gray, gray or blue. Yeah. That is what Actually, they're doing. Uh, right, you can take that a little further. It's like... um a society that can instantly get the answer to any question. You'd think that those people would have awesome conversations. And no, no they're 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 actually kind of ridiculous. They're ridiculous. You know, like the things that they worry about, the things that that is are so concerning. It's just the stupidest stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's sad. That's too it, bad. Listen, that's where we live. Paul, this was fun. I enjoyed this. Look at this. We did two hours today. Can you believe sure. that? I'm gonna have to go. We did. We did now. an hour here and an hour there, and this was a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I I enjoyed doing the show on Tuesdays. This is nice, uh, guys. I appreciate if you're watching live. Uh, 71 people still in the chat. I appreciate all of you for tuning in. If you enjoy this kind of content, we're going to be doing more of this. Go to Patreon.com/slash What the Tech. You could fund us there as little as one dollar per bonus show. You could go do that, or you could hit the fun button right now on YouTube. You could do that also for all things Paul. Go to Therot.com. You can subscribe to the podcast wherever and also hit the subscribe button here on YouTube. That's a huge help. When you hit that subscribe button, it it, it helps build our channel. You'll be shocked how, how much that's worth to us. And uh, that's it for this week. See you later. Look at that. That was cool. Let me shut this off. All right, guys. Uh, thank you.